How the hell did we get to this hell? We're in a war, a civil war. Not everyone knows that that's all and looks the other way. And here I am, having lived half a life lost in the shadowy forest, the dark woods, the underworld. I don't even know how I got here. I must have been asleep at the wheel like Dante and left the true path behind somewhere. So I travel this hell with my allies all behind me, so it seems. I called some this morning. I had a restless night after last night and wondered how they were doing. Not all the ghosts were home. Maybe sleeping in or sharing last night's nightmare, letter one, with a friend over brunch, refining the art of talking behind one's back. Here I was till last night chasing them to chase me to do damage, and now I was chasing them, period. The night after the battle, to count the bodies into body parts and hurt feelings. Had I sinned with letter one? Why was my conscience full of guilt? And why did I feel no need to recant anything? I spoke with the cleaver stuck in the neck ghost first, the suicidal one, my closest. Him I woke up, I didn't mean to, he was groggy, and asked me what time it was. I told him it was early afternoon, and then asked him if he had been haunted during the night by bad writing, mine. He laughed. It's always a good sign if you've got a cleaver stuck in your neck, slowly cutting through all the tiny fibers of your jugular vein. And then he added, hey, a good night was had by all, Tony, it was great. How wonderful he would see the positive in everyone's experience, not only his own. In many ways, a cleaver stuck in his neck doesn't make any sense, and yet right now, it's hard to imagine him without one. Had letter one galvanized him in any way? Does he identify with Jimmy Stewart's George in any way? Does he think this is a wonderful life and worth living, not because of, but perhaps confirmed by last night? Hard to tell. And his laugh, authentic as always, but a laugh of joy or a laugh meant to scare the cleaver playing harp on his jugular? The PhD ghost, supportive as always, and ready for battle, any kind of battle. God bless her, you know? And I was just hoping I hadn't brought on her migrant of the night before. Like a true warrior, she attacked this eye-stabbing nuisance with meds designed for horses, not humans, and natural products that guarantee success in just five minutes, like minute rice, and with a lot of willpower. That probably did it, you know? But this ghost will bring many smiles to many faces of many pharmaceuticals, natural or synthetic. She thinks too much, thank God! and gets it all the time. She just gets it. You know, the patterns, the thoughts, the schemes, and the schemes behind the schemes. The dramaturgical queen and migraines she will have till the day she dies. Her brain and the passion running through it have earned it. A particular concern for the goateed ghost. First concern was that last night I had driven him to shave it off first thing this morning. <laughs> I had delivered to his door my father's obituary days ago, a piece inspired by one his son wrote about his father a year ago as an olive branch, as a way of saying, hey, look, we all have a father, and all fathers die sooner or later. And that's a pity. That bonds us, at least. I was concerned for his feelings, for his hurt, if he hated me, and if he still hated Jews. But I never placed the call. I just imagined the conversation and called the wise man ghost an answering machine. I went to the place I knew he would go just to see me. He does it all the time and then calls it destiny. I was right. He was pallid, weathered, carrying a computer bag over one shoulder and a bag filled with books and scripts and notes over the other. God, I hope they're not for me. Now I'm sounding like him. All the worries of the world, all the concerns, nightmares and problems were somehow packed in those two bags. He was lugging around, his nose practically scraping the sidewalk and street. As he made his way over to the cafe I was sitting in, a 3,000-year-old man who would now half pretend he just happened to be in the neighborhood. I didn't even get a chance to say A, B, C, or O. And he said, Jews are very sensitive right now, Tony. I can't talk to you. I didn't bother calling the ghost who said, it's getting there, Tony. I didn't bother calling the inquisitor ghost, the Jesuit one. He's too busy tailor making a coat without sleeves. As we say in Calabrian, a wooden coat. Those we bury people in. He's working furiously, hoping to get me in there before I die. To bury people alive is the theme tonight. There was an Italian Canadian actress, ghost, very moved, convinced letter one spoke of my frustration she saw as hers, finally being voiced. I left a message for the PR ghost, curious about her comment about Mel Gibson, that though it's true the apple never falls too far from the tree, it's what he does after the fall that matters. And I wondered if racism is all she got from what she got. But in her time, she has crawled to the top of Everest and back a number of times, even touched the sun, and we'd be lucky to know half of what she knows. The French-Canadian couple, theater artists, I did not need to call. They saw everything I had hoped everyone would see without my having to tell them what to look for, how to look for it. Some ghosts in the bar asked me to reveal which ghost was based on them, which part, which bit. You know, I thought their question more interesting and revealing than anything I had written. I mean, I could not possibly call all the ghosts. I would have to, you know, two city phone books at least. 
And what about the ghosts that were actually composites, parts of parts of other parts? How can I call all those parts that made up the whole? Well, to see if it could be done, he drew up a chart, wrote up all the words said by each ghost, who said what, and when, and when did each word, where did it come from, comma, period, all of it. And realize this word was said by that ghost, this other word by one in a book, this from a film, this from someone who got it from someone else who saw a film about a book where so-and-so said this or that, this phrase from a teacher, this spit from a student, a book, another film, an article, a thought, a friend, an enemy, a parent, a lover, all of them from life. How could I possibly call every single ghost? And what if they're all hurt in one way or another but refuse to show it, having an intellect with a highly sophisticated protective shield, a jamming screen to fog enemy radar defenses? I, the enemy. What if those I called this morning, I only thought I called? What if they're actually lying in large piles, strewn all over the place, burned, torched, asphyxiated, boiled dry by my firestorm bombs, 4,500 fucking tons of sadistic hell unleashed from my heart and mind, they, Dresden, and I, an armada of Lancaster bombers, a catastrophe, a horrendous inferno of the brightest red that lit the sky, made day of night, where I painted letter one in jet stream. And what about the no-shows, the mosquito ghosts? Lots of them here tonight, who feared showing up and not being able to resist stinging for their drop of blood, only to die from it. What apology could I possibly owe these ghosts? Were they not a legitimate target? My family had been an unprotected target. Did I apologize to them for inspiring the hell of my first and second play? Why should these ghosts get preferential treatment? Were they victim? or aggressor grappling with retribution? Was I really the Lancaster bomber of Dresden or the spitfire that took to the sky, dog fought to the death to defend London at eight to one odds? Was my message of love not clear? Why not? Was it couched in too much theatrical effect and bombast? Or was I for too much justice and not enough mercy? Was young man Luther, not the old one, he and his anti-Semitism belonged to the goateed ghost. Was young man Luther a heretic for his desire to believe freely and to be a slave to the authority of no one, that one should stand up for what one believes in, even if it means death? Was Socrates a fool to think that an unexamined life is not worth living? Was Dante an idiot to suggest that the proper function of the human race is to actualize continually the entire capacity possible to the intellect? My mediocrity consumes me. You know, you would think that all those who came before might have produced a different me, or you. But we're stuck with what we're stuck with, and what we call home doesn't help. It equates awareness of mediocrity with low self-esteem, and misses the point, as it always does, and celebrates effort that never was. Theater is not a place for an easy life. The many questions and lack of answers are not compatible with a good night's sleep. And when my father saw my second play, all dark and comedy, where the character of the father wraps a noose around his neck and hangs in the cantina like cured meat, all he said was, well, sometimes it's better to laugh. My mother said it was exaggerated. My sister said it didn't go far enough. And my younger brother said that in the future, I should consult with him before inviting my parents to a piece of thing like that. When I told him he'd have felt more at home in the Italy of the 1930s, he said, in Mussolini's Italy, Tony, you would have been fucking dead. The silent civil war was on. Two brothers, he angry at me, concerned our father would mimic the character in the play, the one he had inspired, and take his own life. I angry at him for being angry at me. I left him sitting in his car in a downtown Montreal intersection. I told him I'd worry more about him doing it to himself before our father would even think of it. And I left, he crying behind the steering wheel, frozen at that intersection. You know, some thought I hated really hated the father in that play, trapped in the hatred for their own father. Some believed I was the defense lawyer for the father. Some begged me not to take the play back to the old country. Embarrassed about the mess we'd made of ourselves here in Canada, they had few words but shame. Some wanted a different ad for the Italian community, a different face, flavor, highlights of an Italian father knows best and all that made in Italy crap type mentality. You know, like spraying expensive perfume and plastering makeup on a corpse, it's still dead. Some thought it had been written with their pain, their blood. It was their story I was telling, and I had no business in their business. There was a lot of love in that play. Pain gave it birth. There is no shame in that. There is shame in this. One of the shining lights of 70s theaters in Toronto, decorated with a silver ticket award for his contribution to theater, said that the character of the father was so grotesque, garish, and unlikable. God, Tony. I mean, maybe the cultural divide was not allowing him to understand or appreciate any of it. Any of it. Well, maybe wasn't a maybe. There is a cultural divide. 
And it excludes Italian-Canadian characters and plays whose models are still among us, hard-working sons of bitches whose tax dollars and sweat have alimonied the Michel Tremblays and the Georgia Fwockers. Imagine what this cultural divide makes of Canadian characters and plays. My father went to his grave, perhaps feeling betrayed by his son's pen, the very thing he resented lacking throughout his life, a life he sacrificed so his children could possess one. I mean, why should we care about a play we've never seen, Tony? Asked the wise man ghost. The PhD ghost bubble-headed it. Yeah, good question, Tony. Answer that one. Well, because the play is irrelevant. It's about the reaction to it, about trying to silence the whistling kettles. And so hating himself in letter one, the wise man ghost asked me a letter one type question. And don't eat me, Tony. Please don't eat me. I mean, is systematic stealing, thieving, and looting, Tony, of the lives and family members legitimate or fair? Are you not like a blood-sucking vampire? Just a question, Tony. Don't eat me. I mean, where else are you going to write from? Even when you're writing about something else, where? I mean, can I pretend even for a minute that these letters, even with their embroidered fiction, don't ultimately expose me for the fool that I am, even where I wish they didn't? The imagination, said Pirandello, any work of art, however great, can never match or surpass the beauty and horror of life. I happen to agree, but agree that there are enough people out there who disagree. I wrote these letters with life, the co-writer. Is it not enough to thank life? I owe these ghosts nothing but hatred and compassion for the hell we created together. And I will never be a cold recorder of what I see and hear. Now, the theater family believes, for the most part, that surrendering one's dirty laundry to a dramatic context is essential for the healing of society. They almost have a sick joy in seeing people's miserable lives and guts spill that on stage. You know, the juicier the material, the better. Better what? We don't know. The Roman spectator made modern theater practitioner where the lions are the actors, writers, and directors, the coroners, the Mengele's. God forbid, you know, it should be one of their bodies on that slab, their character under the knife. The PhD ghost once said that if you don't like fluids, you shouldn't be having sex. Well, the theater family likes fluids, but they like to keep it clean, so they like other people's fluids. The theater family gathers around a table, you know, to discuss ideas, projects, and original works. Someone, maybe you, will propose this. Hey, you know what? I'm thinking about doing a play about a sick, tired, old grain elevator. You know, in some Western Canada scrapyard, lamenting a bygone era, where it could find one of its own every 12 miles. The good old days, you know, where not too long ago, school children singing eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a nigger by the toe, would echo all over the prairies, not even knowing what that meant, you know what I mean? Where the people even now take such care of their artists, especially gays and vegetarians, they even prescribe remedies for their ills, and even put it on billboards, like the health warning to Katie Lang. What she needs is a good fucking steak. Well, apparently she tried it, didn't like it. We're in one of those grain elevators in the presence of a donkey, an ox, and a couple of lambs. A mother gave birth to a little boy who became a man one day, hog-like in girth, but lacking the intelligence of a pig, and now runs one of the G8 countries. That's the play I want to do, you know? And what we can learn from that, you know, I mean, it's got the history of the racism, the gay thing, you know, politics, our move towards more and more organic food. A little pause, the bobbleheads bobble in unison, you know, turn right, then left, each one making sure they're not the only one bobbling. And then they're told the director will do research with the writer on history, racism, homosexuality, and vegetarianism in Western Canada, and politics. And we'll need money for that. More bobbling. Good, good. This is good. Very good, very good. The cast will be selected from various ethnic communities. Lots of bobbling. 13 ethnic communities, to be exact, to go with the 10 provinces and the three territories. Symmetry is very important. It's part of the organic structure of the piece. And unity! Bobbleheads go crazy. Chiropractors are ecstatic. <laughs> The role of Katie Lang will be played by a guy, straight guy, with a hairy chest and beard. Her accusers will be gay and fey to explore the yin and yang of the whole thing, you know what I mean? And the irony, did I mention the whole piece about irony? There will be some nudity, but not the one we normally see. Oversized penises are crucial to the visual characteristics of the piece as we explore the rise and fall of the grain elevators. And the programs will be handwritten with menstrual blood. It's all about the organic process, how the body and the voice animate the invisible. You know, by the time the bobbleheads are really confused, they know they've got a new Canadian hit on their hands. <laughs> The hit gets announced before it even hits the theater. Next, it's your turn. And you tell them, well, I'm thinking about doing a play about those who do plays. <laughs> they vanish. What makes one patriotic? Scream the headline. Blind allegiance or questioning our role? You know, I didn't even read the article. I like the question so much. The kind you can take with you to a monastery, to prison, or to the theater. But in Canada, analyzing the culture is unpatriotic. A deadly assault on the national amour propre. There's no place for a critical mind in a country that embraces a national disrespect for the mind. The theater family, I'm told, by people searching for courage in bestseller, motivational, life-changing books, has gone to the mattresses, you know, braces itself, ready to defend, deny, attack, worse than my family, way worse. 
A bull of excommunication is apparently being drafted as we speak. Perhaps here in this room. At least that's what I'm told. Those sitting closest to you are usually the ones to watch out for. But I have faith in the theater family, not the group, you know, real or imagined, but as individuals, a group of scared theater artists. It's like an actor Christmas party where there's no party or Christmas, but Halloween mask without masks, comparing contracts, awards, credits, membership to this and that association, indulgences, the ones they pay with their souls to speed entry into the kingdom of fame and immortality. But an individual with a group of fears standing alone, that I trust. And Socrates warning, that orators are less concerned with the pursuit of truth than in using their skills to obtain power and influence haunts me as I try to figure out the reasons behind my reasons. But let's be clear, if I can do this to my family, the major one, the one that gave me life and paradoxically from birth tried to kill anything authentic in me, my other family, my lesser family, theater, is way more fair game, especially since this lesser family thinks it's okay to exploit the major one, the major one for its own glory. Yeah, some say, but come on, the theater has too many enemies outside the theater. It can't afford enemies within the theater, Tony. It won't survive. Well, most people in the world have a physical relationship with that word survival. Thankfully, we don't for the most part and can eat three meals a day and can afford the luxury of borrowing the word, playing around with its meaning, give it a new one every once in a while. To us in the theater, survival generally implies an image problem, a must have toy or pastime without which our Canadian identity would perish. Well, losing something one doesn't have to begin with defies logic as I understand it. So who are the enemies within the theater? Who are these warring voices within? And trying to find the enemy is no easy task. Like all good wars, there are two heroes, one on each side, two good guys, two enemies, depending who you talk to, both defending, protecting their fears. And it's a fucking nightmare. Like the actor I met in a nightmare in broad daylight in a quiet CD store. He wasn't wearing a monk-like cloak with hood masking his eyes and countenance. So it was hard to say what he was, but I had a feeling, you know. We hadn't seen each other for about a year, but I'd seen him a few months before in a large hardware store with my six month old prophet in a stroller. As I turned to face the direction of the stroller, I saw him walking towards me, but making a sharp right down the aisle, away from me, no eye contact. Strange, I thought, you know, he must have seen me before I saw him and yet he didn't stop, why? He avoided me the way one avoids those one intends to avoid, like I had something he could catch and die from it. He had never seen my child before and chose to avoid him too. Why? This is not like him. Or maybe it was more like him than the him I knew. I mean, true, we weren't that close. He's the kind of actor that when he drinks tells you he wants to marry you. That if he were gay and you were an Aries, he would marry you because he <laughs> likes Aries. The kind who likes to break bread with you now and then, not when he wants, but when no one wants to break bread with him and not to get closer to you, but to make sure you become one of those who takes care of him and his issues of the day, like an AA sponsor. The kind who tells you, you read a lot, when he meant to say how little he reads. The kind that when you work together, he tells you that all his life, he's waited for this moment, for this chat to build a future on. Isn't it great, Tony? What? This, you and me here doing it. Well, lots of people are doing it. No, yeah, but we're doing it now. That kind of guy, <laughs> one of the damned. But the CD store has no aisles and no possibility for sharp turns away, only the door, the one I came in through when we stood face to face. And you have a choice when you meet the damned, kill or be killed. He must have been thinking that too. You descend to hell making a way for the ascent while pretending to buy a CD, the way the damned pretend they like the music of the heart. Hey, hey, wow, what, so, what? You're good, yeah, you? Well, doing this thing, what thing? Well, a thing, with who? Well, with some people, you know. Are you having fun? Well, you know, Tony, no director. Were you scheduled to have one? Oh, yeah, yeah, he's there. I mean, he's just not there, you know. You know, same old, you know. How do you do it? Do what? This thing. Well, it depends on the thing and the people, but generally I do what you do, which is? Well, your best. Well, we tried that, Tony. It doesn't work, not with this one. I mean, same fucking old, but you, fuck! What do you mean? Well, fuck, apparently you wrote a letter. And I write many letters. No, no, but I'm talking about the letter. To who? Well, you know, our colega. What did you think? It's very hard. What? The letter. Did you read it? No, I heard about it. What did you hear? Well, what they told me. Who told you? Well, friends who read it. Well, how did they get it? Well, they didn't. They heard about it. From who? Well, the colega. Do you know anything about the letter? No, no. I just heard that you wrote it and it was hard. People are very upset with you. You mean people who heard from those who heard about it? Yeah, I guess. But you didn't hear from them. No, I guess not. You heard from those they heard from. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. 
Yeah, let's get back to your director and your concern. Did you ever think of sharing with him the tremendous respect you have for his craft, his originality, inventiveness, and of course his humanity, how you can feel him in your bones? Are you fucking crazy, Tony? No, did you ever think of telling him how loyal you are to his idea of how theater could be practiced? Are you fucking kidding me, Tony? He's a fucking hack! Same old! Well, what about that you accept responsibility for not waking up earlier to the fact that things were pretty well fucked up from the beginning, you know, but that you would place your trust in him and his craft, like the others, the kind you rarely give a director. Tony, I wouldn't fucking trust this guy. I don't know what the... Tony, are you okay, Tony? We're fucking doomed. We open tonight. I'm picking up some fucking opening night fucking gifts, Tony. <laughs> well, does he say he's an actor's director? Well, that's what he's known for. Who says? Well, everyone, Tony, that's why I'm doing this. Well, does he often say he likes actors when they're confused? Oh, I don't know if he fucking likes it, Tony, but we are fucking confused, and so is he. Well, what, what kind of a play is it? I don't fucking know, Tony! I'm trying to help you. We open tonight, Tony. What are you gonna fucking tell him? You're talking funny, Tony. You're right. I'm quoting from a letter. What letter? Never mind. Look, what was the first exercise you ever did in theater school? Well, you know, Tony. No, I wanna know from you. Well, you get up on some fucking table, Tony. You throw yourself and you hope the actors catch you. You know, the fucking trust thing. I feel sick, Tony. Well, that's good. What? That you're sick. Call in sick. Well, they, that wouldn't be fair. To who? Well, the other actors, Tony. The theater, everyone. Well, what about the audience who has to sit through this? What? You! What do you mean, Tony? I mean, your sickness. Well, you had to perform sick, don't, no, 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 not this sick. You're really fucking sick, don't go. Well, I'll never work again, Tony. They wouldn't ask me back. Who? The theater, back where? The theater, well, why would you want to go back? I mean, the director might like confused actors. An audience never does. It's a job, Tony. I don't fucking work like you do, make the money you do. I'm broke, you're what? You see, you can't hear my line. How are you gonna hear the other actors? Stay at home, don't fucking go. Fuck, Tony, fuck. Fuck, fuck. Well, would you if you could? Yeah, fuck yeah, I would, but I can't. Look, I'll try to help you, okay? I would feel sorry for any audience that has to sit through you. You can't do justice to a character, any character, classic or modern, including yours, not because of your talent, your stupidity! That's the problem. You infect all your characters with your stupidity. Is this helping you? Let me know if it's not. Don't you read the script before knowing what your character says? Always, Tony. Well, don't you investigate and try to see his side instead of yours, what he says about himself, what others say about him? Yeah, Tony, that's like the fucking basic, basic, Tony! And so the open mind, spirit, and compassion you apparently dedicate to that, where is it in this? Which this? This! Me! I'm a character. One you might have to play one day, you fucking idiot. I'm just helping you. A character you judge through a letter you never saw or read. What? Have you read The Crucible? Well, I forget a lot of it. You know, how do I say I'm not surprised without saying it? If you'd read it, you wouldn't forget it. It's that kind of play. Well, maybe I've read too many fucking plays. Tony, it's opening night. I gotta go. No, no, don't go, don't go. Think of the audience. Give the moment some grace. At least give them that. Don't go. What are you gonna say in your opening night cards? What? Well, same old. Is it fun? Trying to save yourself from the high court of Salem, you son of a bitch naming names and fearing God knows what. Is it fun? What are you talking about, Tony? It's a fucking gig, Tony. I'm fucking gigging, okay? And you have the gall to ask me how I deal with directors. If I had the answer, if I did, you would actually do something with it? I did something, and Herr Kollege, director in Germany, has my letter. It's yours to read. Be careful, there's a lot of love running through. It could be harmful if you're not used to it. And when you go home tonight, do me a favor, don't hang yourself. That should be reserved for people with principles. Jesus Christ, Tony, it's opening night, all right? My wife fucking left me. Well, I'm sorry about that. You know, a guy worked with, went home one day and found his wife hanging from a light fixture over the bed they had shared for a lifetime. He couldn't save her in time. Your wife did the smart thing. She didn't kill herself. She saved you, left you to yourself, weaned you for good so you can choose between formula and solids. Now thank her. I mean, I can forgive you for what you said, but I can't forgive you for what I had to say to you. Have a great opening. <laughs> but nobody moved. Thinking too many things to select the one thought that would best describe the moment. I lit a cigarette without thinking, gave him one without thinking, and dropped the match to the floor without thinking. Though all along I knew what I was doing, knowing there are no accidents and that everything is for a reason. Too many people say it for people to ignore it. He smoked his cigarette, I smoked mine. The cigarette seemed to produce more smoke than usual. And I'm thinking, you know, I may not be a practicing Catholic, but I've learned well from my church and how to deal with heretics. And as we inhaled some hell into our lungs, I tried to decide if he was a hypocrite, a traitor, a deceiver, or a flatterer. It didn't matter. He was one or possibly all of those things, and he was burning. That's what mattered. Roasting. I was too close to him, so I felt the lick and the heat of the hot flame. He didn't seem to mind the fucking burning, as if trying to make me feel guilty and shitty for making him feel shitty about himself. And I realized that pride can look tougher than courage. And this son of a bitch didn't flinch, making me think I was burning and only saw him through the flames, the one surrounding me, not him. 
The whole place was actually on fire. Must have been. We could hear people running for cover in the door, coughing, sirens, hundreds of CDs, suddenly playing all at once, one last time, really pissed off. They had to put that kind of energy in defiance, not for pleasure, howling and singing at the same time. That was a hell all its own. And then through the flames, books flying all over the place, detonating one by one from the center of the volcano where he had just stood. Oh, so he was burning, not me, I thought. Great. Shooting out like fireworks and hot coals. Definitely the must-read books. The top 100 that would have changed your fucking life have you bothered to read them books? But they didn't burn, you know, and I'm thinking 9-11. That poor son of a bitch, you know, was minding his own business, sipping coffee and looking out the window as he saw in slow motion the nose of a plane delivering a hell at 500 miles an hour and that he didn't make it. How could he? But that some of his office files and eight by 10 pages survived that nightmare unscathed and actually rubbed it in by taking their sweet time, sipping tea even on their way down, traveling like butterflies on paper planes, you know, through 100 floors of nothingness landing on the massive dead pile of ground zero. You know, like these books, they seem to thrive in this hell as if the fire and burning flesh of our actor friend had given birth to them and I was resenting them, the fucking books. Not for what they say, not because they last and not the way Shaw resented Shakespeare because he actually loved them, but because it didn't make a difference. They had not made a fucking difference. Yeats, Shaw, Ibsen, Strindberg, Chekhov, and we still had the Great War. Pirandello, Artaud, Brecht, and O'Neill couldn't prevent World War II. De Filippo, Miller, Williams, Foe, and Pinter, and all the others could not prevent what has happened since. The smoke decreased and the flames just got bigger, and I could see him now still standing, smiling picking a crusty scab on his face, playing, twirling it between thumb and middle finger and flinging it at me to see if I'd flinch. Fucking right, scared the hell out of me. And then I heard the other voices. Hey, they're both dead. Who smokes in a CD shop? Jesus Christ. Apparently it didn't matter who went into which bag. We were both beyond recognition. I just heard the sound of one zipper zipping and assumed we'd been shoveled into one. And I woke up in bed, still stinking of sulfur. I washed, dressed, went to rehearsal, saw the actor, said good morning, both knowing it wasn't, and rehearsed the play like good little boys and girls. End of prologue. Dear Mr. Kamal al Solili, dear Mr. Richard Azunian, you have absolutely no idea how many people have ushered me here to this chamber in hell coming week in, week out to readings of these letters, previous drafts and incarnations as I try to find the common ground in us. I created a coliseum for myself, invited a bunch of lions, threw myself into the middle to see what happens, to get to know their nature and mine, thinking I would build a thicker skin. But with each reading, they tore down that wall with a force so natural to human nature. They tore me to fucking shreds, ripped me apart with feedback and contradictions. They made of me and are continuing to make of me what they want to make of me. The PhD ghost possibly winning by a dramaturgical mile. Let's see how she develops me through this. And the pieces of my body are all over the place now, stuck to every wall of every space I've traveled to with these readings as I try to reassemble them to make sense of a life that was. I don't know where I'm speaking from. I don't even fucking know where this voice is coming from. But I know that wherever it's coming from, whatever body part, it speaks the truth, my truth, or what's left of it. I speak to you like brothers in arms, as a family. Remember that. The production of The Amorous Servant was an x-ray of the debilitating and widespread illness afflicting professional theater in Canada. Your reviews were limbs belonging to the same ailing, diseased body, and they helped spread the virus. What a shame, I thought. You know, if you actually thought and believed your opinions on Commedia and Goldoni were worthy of print in Canada's two largest English language newspapers, but you did write the reviews, and they were published. I have to assume you embrace and stand by them. I mean, there is the possibility, and I have to allow for that, that in moments of weakness and self-doubt, like those the rest of humanity has from time to time, including and especially actors, writers, and directors, in short, all artists, a voice whispers to you in the wee hours of the morning, you know, an inner voice saying, what the hell was I talking about? Since I'm nowhere near your inner voice, I'll go with what you wrote instead. I know you're different one from the other. I want to avoid making my preference of a critic an issue. No contest. Kamal, the more sentient and reflective by far. While Richard takes us back to a time of tight ascotted actors and directors sipping teas and gin tonicking their livers to the sound of their own giggles. But you struck a similar irresponsible chord with your reviews, one that springs, I believe, from a fundamental ignorance of Commedia dell'arte, Uzunian's years in professional theater notwithstanding. I mean, you'll get no argument from me. All crimes should be reported, including those in the theater on stage. The amorous servant deserved the criticism it got, and then some. 
That criticism should fall on the shoulders of the person not qualified to bring it to life on stage, the director. You were actually light on him. I'm not suggesting you should have been hard or harder, but given how hard you were on those you should have been light on, you were light on him. If you believe you have a better understanding of Goldoni or Kamita than the director, you are committing two crimes each on top of his. Bottom line, more people will have read your reviews than will have seen the production of The Amorous Servant. Way more. Refreshing, thank God, and sadly, is the fact that ultimately, 32 million Canadians won't give a fuck what you say and what the production had to say. A blessing for now, until we earn the curse. Before I continue, I'd like to give you here the opportunity to leave now if you wish. You know, the PR ghost thought that I was, you know, this was only a sort of a cute device and that nobody would take me seriously. Even you, anybody. But I am serious, you know. I mean, she didn't take me seriously for sure. I mean, she doodled and sighed through a pre-reading of letter two, irritated and angry at me and genuinely overwhelmed at her lack of trust in me. I mean, you gotta love a PR ghost, you know, who's got her finger on the pulse of every nobody. The PhD ghost insisted I cut this section, by the way, and move to one of the sections she had asked me to cut two weeks ago in favor of this one, you know? There's a clinical name for that. It's called medication or something. But I am serious, you know, of course I want you here, otherwise I, w I wouldn't be here, but you can leave anytime you want. Don't do me any fucking favors, that works against me and you. Leave when you're bored! That's the best dramaturgy. <laughs> and those beside you will resent you initially, you know, wish they could hide under your coat and go with you, you know? <laughs> But they might care less about their lives and more about their image, you know. Show them the way, please. Leave, go, go, no, I'm serious, go. Anytime during this reading, just fucking go. Leave, I care about your life. And boredom is one thing you should not be spending it on. But I'm warning you, if you stay, no snoring, please. <laughs> it's not encouraged here or advisable. It doesn't bother me, I mean, no, it's for you, I mean, you know. I mean, we don't want to know where your hands travel to when you're sleeping, and I don't think you'd want us to know. And then we'd have to deal with how you feel about it once you wake up and realize you're not at home in your own bed, but in a theater where sleeping was not the purpose of the evening. For this purpose, we leave the lights on so you can actually keep an eye on each other, you know? So no one cheats, and the camera's filming you. And as you will discover, it's not pretty to look at. You know, there's always the odd clever one, you know, with his back to this one and his hand over his face, you know, to hide from the other one, you know, creating a human alcove kind of thing, you know, pretending he's deep in thought, you know, mulling over every single word by this and that actor while power napping, you know, through Shakespeare Shaw and everyone in between and after. In fact, he goes to the theater to experiment, devise new techniques, how to sleep without being detected, getting cocked. What a fucking nightmare. And when he's sure he's got it all worked out, you know, elbow, elbow anchored to his rib, you know, the head falls back and, you know, you don't want that. You know, how many times did I nap while kneeling in front of that altar at 6 a.m. at nine years old, you know, with my back to the audience waiting for my cue to ring the Sanctus bells. As the lead actor in spectacular costume played with his props, with his perfectly manicured and moisturized hands, gently unwrapping the gold rim page from the Bible, stroking the cloth divider into place with a tenderness reserved for the skin of choice, as if everything that had been deprived him, he now put into everything he touched, especially on that altar and possibly those little ones kneeling in front of him. And then with open arms and look into the heavens, he read his lines with trademark boredom. How many times did I miss my cue? How many <clears throat> coughs and loud snifflings were the priest forced to invent and improvise day after day? But the baggy black cassock and the white surplus allowed us to rest our butts on our heels, you know, which only encouraged more napping and more snoring, you know? I was technically an altar boy, but in reality, one of the sinners. And the scripture sounded better in my head than how it was being delivered. I knew then that if my salvation was at all possible, it secretly lay in scripture or in me, not in the over-costumed actor. So why was he there? Why did we need him? And why should he direct my soul? Why should he broker my relationship with God at 15% commission? You don't know that you need to be saved when you're born until someone tells you you're in trouble, that you've always been in trouble and you better get rid of it. And that happens pretty early in life, you know? And as more of us realize we're in trouble, we realize we need more people to help us get rid of that trouble. And like every good little Catholic, I was so excited to learn that my body and soul contain more sin than anything else, than bones, than blood, than flesh. <laughs> you know, not because I liked sin. It's like being told you possess a quality in quantity you didn't know you had. It's a gold mine, a treasure trove for a child. And looking for your sins is so much fun. You know, you don't even have to worry about running out. Hell, you commit new ones, supply and demand. And when I didn't know what other sin to commit, I broadened the definition of what qualified. You know, if getting rid of all your sins practically guarantees salvation, let's up the number of sins to get rid of. 
It's a reward system type logic a child has no problem with, you know? How many sins? Wow, and you've repented for all of them? Wow, that's good. Yeah, you know, I think I've confessed more than any other altar boy. I'm actually the lead scorer in goals and assists. Should get the heart and the Art Ross trophies, I think, you know? But no, we got a dime a mass. And so we chose weddings and funerals because they paid a quarter. And some weeks we thought people were not marrying or dying fast enough. And so we prayed for people to marry and die. That was a sin. Hey, hit the confessional. I was in and out of those fucking confessionals like a French farce, you know, two, three, four times a day and disguise my voice now and then, <laughs> which I later counted as a sin. Good reason to justify entry into the confessional once again. Go, quick. I was never home, lived in church, committing and confessing sins. I was a nine-year-old cottage industry and I wanted to become a priest. And I believed deeply while stealing money I was collecting for the church. And when I went home, I would reenact the mass, all of it in the kitchen. And my mother, you know, she cooked and yelled at me, hurry up with the mass! So she could use a table for lunch or supper. <laughs> but priests couldn't touch skin officially. That was no good. All I wanted to do was touch, even at that age. And then I saw Rock Hudson, not the real one, but one who could have given him a good run for his money. You know, he was a priest, ordained and everything, you know, or maybe just a brother, but well on his way in our high school, stunning and substituting for our English lit teacher. You know, I didn't know enough about Pip and Miss Havisham and about myself to know that that's what I should have been reading. I mean, it's what we were supposed to read, what everyone in the class was reading and had been told to read in silence after reading chapter one, the heading, not the chapter, chapter one. I reread it and I couldn't get beyond that. I just looked at Rock Hudson, you know, deep in thought, who was just sitting at the teacher's desk, you know, like he was being painted or sculpted by someone who wasn't there, you know, and I thought, wow, man, look at that, he can do it. I certainly can. His office is stacked with dozens of beautiful girls each day. More girls squeeze into that office than can fit into a gym, and it's a tiny office. And he just goes on talking about God, sin, and salvation. He's doing it, so can I. And I shared this revelation with my neighbor, and we laughed that maybe the rock priest was not, wasn't all that he seemed. What if he's sleeping with one of those girls, or all of them? <laughs> More laughs, you know, until I suddenly swallowed mine, thanks to a whack on the back of my head. It was rock. Tony, what did the teacher ask you to do? <clears throat> the laughs clogging my throat initially gave me a funny voice. Uh, read Great Expectations, Father. Yeah, so do what the fucking teacher told you to do before I take this fucking book and shove it down your fucking throat. Boy, did he earn that pause. <laughs> and I hated his fucking guts. Aside from the jokes and laughter, I was very serious about the priest thing, and I thought, oh, God, he is fucking those girls. He swore he's not supposed to. Where does he draw the line? He doesn't. He makes it up as he goes along. He's a fucking liar, a living lie. And in that moment, I felt what I couldn't put into words. Many years later, I realized the man had voiced those words many years before upon his first entry into Rome. Rome, he said a spiritual place full of a lot of unspiritual people. By the time I read those words, I thought Luther was talking about much more than the Rome of 1510. The church schools and theater of my life were the Rome of 1510. Well, Rock Hudson left the priesthood, surprise. He got married to one of the girls crammed into his office. And the story of Pip, finding oneself can be a long, tedious process until finally the mist rise and everything becomes clear. I couldn't read Pip then because I was living him. But there was no mist in 1979 when I entered Darwin's on Bishop Street in Montreal and came face to face with the devil, a review. Fitting that we should be in a place called Darwin's. Fitting that we should be celebrating the opening night of Arthur Copet's play, Indians. Actors and directors were doing what actors and directors normally do after a show, putting out more energy than they had put out on stage. I was in a corner somewhere, depressed like hell, wondering how we could stop the derailment that had started on the first preview. No, the first day of rehearsal. And so I sat next to the director, knowing that if any answers would appear that night, they would have to make sense to him. The other actors mocked me that I was too serious, too soon, too young, that I should get on with it and leave the show behind. I was a novice, and the advice was, was well-intended. Professional, real professional actors, Tony, leave their characters behind once they leave the stage. I mean, I've never believed that. Didn't believe it then. Maybe at a craft level to a certain point, yes, but not at a creative spiritual level. And those who can leave a character on stage once they leave it are traveling a two-way street. They leave themselves off stage once they're on it. But the air was slowly changing, telling me that those who were telling me to get on with it were obsessed with it, a different it. To mask their despair, their chatter and laughter became progressively disjointed and manic. It wasn't the liquor. I mean, I'd never been to the Sistine Chapel, but I knew that one day I would see those faces in The Last Judgment and might have recognized them from a book. I mean, chit-chat was coming out of their mouths and alcohol was going into them, but each mouth was actually mouthing a silent howling, help me. It didn't matter what they said and what I heard. What I saw was, help me, like a badly dubbed Italian film. The producer suddenly shows up 
in the back patio. <clears throat> Everyone expected him, but not at that moment. So they fucking jumped and freaked. Ah, wah! He got so fucking scared. I mean, he's a producer, you know, and he thrives on solid ground. You know, one foot in front of the other on the fucking ground. Reality, the one most of the actors had abandoned once they had left the stage and hit the bar. Their ground was not even there. These flatterers were now in a ditch, swimming in brown excrement, very likely flushed out from human latrines, waiting for the words that would deliver them from hell. And the producer announces, they're not in yet. A united writhing sigh lunged from their souls, immediately followed by a surprising sigh of relief, which told me this was a matter of life and death. Death row, like they'd been told they've got a few more minutes to live, as if the hangman were on a break, so drink up, order another round, while well, you still can, and they did. And then the producer left. Um, what, I asked, what's not in yet? About a dozen Linda Blairs turned towards me, slowly bypassed your mother sucks cocks, and said, the reviews, Tony. <laughs> Idiot was implied. They explained to me, like a teacher to a child, the immediately after opening night tradition of waiting for reviews, as in, you got a problem with that, Tony? As their devils recoiled into their souls. Oh boy, this is not a fun night, I thought. But what do you need to know that you don't know already, I said. You know, if the person writing has any sense, he, she will be able to see what works and what doesn't and say so. Well, I might as well have killed their mothers, you know. It was all new to me. And this drama in a bar more dramatic and relevant than anything we had tried to pull off on stage. Their obsession had now turned those yet-to-be-delivered reviews into a beast. And the cast took sides, all of them with Jack and Roger, the angry, savage, sadistic torturers, except for me. And the young actress who swore during the entire rehearsal that she wore no panties, and this was the night she'd prove it. You know, on any other night, I would have welcomed the pleasure as the defining moment of my life. I mean, no fucking Caesar would have dragged me back to Rome away from this Cleopatra. Besides, she came with a death certificate with my name on it, and that was appealing at 21. Not a bad way to die. But no, survival was the only thing on my mind that night at Darwin's. And as they joked about the beast, the review, who would get, who would it kill, who would it spare, keeping me out of it, but wanting me to get into it, to reveal more, it was a setup, and I knew it. And where would I run? I had taken the seat furthest from the patio door, making sure I could keep an eye on the enemies walking in. Now, those I considered friends were the enemy to fear, dreaming of hunting pigs. And so I chose my words carefully, but they were still my words. I gave them my review. What I thought were the show's weaknesses and strengths. Silence. One of the actors approached me, like speaking for the tribe and about to announce my sentence. Uh, what you say about the show may be true, Tony, but that's not what we want the reviewer to say. Well, why not, I ask? Isn't it the truth? The truth might prevent people from coming to the show, Tony. Better bums in the seats than a theater filled with truth and nothing else. Truth can strangle theater altogether. Well, you mean people decide to come or not based on what they read? Shit, that's a lot of pressure on the reviewer, I said. What if he doesn't know what he's talking about? Having been told it was a he. Well, thank you for joining us, Tony. That's the fucking point. They don't always, so we're worried. There's no respect for critics at this table, Tony. They're almost always failed writers or actors, therefore envious and jealous of who they, what they write, who they write. Do you fucking dig, Tony? Snapping judgments in some little fucking bullshit review after we work hard on something for weeks. Are you digging, Tony? We know who the real critics are, Tony. Ordinary people, you and me, will always say much more intelligent things than critics, but they decide our life and death, and so we hate them. We have to hate them, Tony, even when we like what they write. Well, I, I hope this guy knows what he's talking about, I said, because it's pretty clear to me where we fucked up. Well, he slapped me so hard, I thought I'd have to scrape my face off the wall behind me. You know, and then he laughed, apologized, said he was sorry, apologized again, and said he loved me. Okay, now I can smell the alcohol. But in vino veritas told me he had told the truth, so I better not hit him back. Silently, I was cheering for the critic. Don't fail me, you bastard. You don't see the fucking problems. We're fucked. And what's taking your fucking review so long? It sucks. Don't see it. What does it take? Two seconds to write. Isn't that enough? Did we earn more than that? They thought so. The producer shows up again with beast in hand. Ten copies of Bailey's review. He throws one so hard at me, I knew what it said. Good news for theater. Bad news for them. Worse news for me. Head swiveled my way. I had no choice but to read. The review was 100% positive as far as I was concerned. In the number of negatives, it managed to stuff into a couple of paragraphs, all of them earned. He described it like one who had lived through the production, you know, for as long as we had. You know, he had not compromised. I might think differently about it now, mind you, who knows? He wasn't trying to be for anyone, he just was. My first impression of critics was therefore positive. I mean, I had anticipated their reaction, but I couldn't understand the degree of disappointment. 
The funny thing is the critic liked most of it, but took issue with most of it as well. And they took issue with what he took issue with, as if that was all that he had written. Some even consulted their portable dictionary to see what level of praise or criticism he had intended with this or that word. A nuance in the meaning they had not considered could help them feel better or worse about themselves, meticulously looking for exhibits, the murder weapon, and death warrants. They were fucking drunk, but boy, were they focused. <laughs> Same actors who complain about having to do a show back to back. One of the actors yelled, God! You know, like those I'd heard in the church during funerals, saying goodbye to their loved one for the last time, when the casket leaves the church and the world for good, to the sound of Mozart's requiem. Another actor threw up and was rushed to the bathroom, yelling, I'll get you for this, totally, I'll get you. It felt like a cue. You see, I said he does know what he's talking about. If we had wanted different results, we should have put a different effort into it. Besides, if you want bums in the seats, you don't need critics for that. Sell off the show by hand, door to door, before opening night exactly what I did with some colleagues with my first place. So leave the guy alone. Let him do his job. But I'd forgotten something. Bailey had not been hard on me, quite the contrary. But that's not the reason I liked what he wrote. Try to tell him that. I mean, these masks were too bent on ending my life, chanting, roast the pig, roast the pig. No use trying to talk sense to them. So I made a run for it, slipping and sliding and all that shit. I ran through the bar, out the door. I didn't think about, fuck paying, shit, I didn't pay. They were right behind me and gaining speed like some boulder I knew I wouldn't be able to dodge. And I can hear them yelling behind me, it's the fucking beast, kill the beast, kill the beast, kill the beast, kill the beast. And we're worried about critics? The waitress reappears. It felt like she'd been gone forever. She asked if we want another round. Nah, said the group. We got two fucking shows tomorrow. And we left. I was the last one out, right behind the actress, who in the dark corridor lifted the back of her dress. She was right. You know, I consider healthy, vigorous debate an essential part of what it is to be human and civilized. And I agree with F. Scott Fitzgerald. Life is the ability to entertain two contradictory ideas simultaneously without going crazy. The PhD ghost has taken this ability to a new height during the course of these letters. Perhaps the reason why she wanted me to put the Fitzgerald line back in. My intent is not to make fools of you, Kamal and Richard, the way some critics at times in print make fools of actors and might take joy in it. I certainly don't mean to demean your profession either or pretend in any way that I can do what you do week in, week out, especially under time and space constraints. And I know you have families and children and love them. I know you want spirits to enforce, art to enchant, like every poor son of a bitch in this world. And I know you want theater to prevent the living from joining the dead and the dead to dance through the living. I'm not saying you don't know what you like or that you can't see a report on what doesn't work on stage. I'm not suggesting you have no understanding of theater either. Toronto is, after all, and apparently the third largest English language theater center in the world. Forget language for the moment. Forget that the city is a multicultural to boot with a wealth of phenomenally talented and some very well-known artists and actors from former Eastern Bloc countries and elsewhere who left their country of birth in the 70s and 80s to breathe political freedom in their middle age, no less, only to be condemned to washing dishes and scrubbing toilet bowls for the rest of their fucking lives because there was no place for them in Toronto's corner gas, trailer park boys, mainstream theater. Forget that. Forget that a number of them are now dead and had more craft knowledge than most people practicing theater in Canada, especially in the 70s and 80s, and that we didn't know how to invite that knowledge in, but knew only too well how to dismiss it, them, and where they came from. Forget that Toronto's theater history and lore extols, at times, ad nauseum, only the English language reality, worthy of Je Me Souviens of Quebec's license plates, that arrogantly boasts to the world that recorded history is the birthright of those two, of those more equal, those who belong to the two official founding nations, those who see no irony in the patriotic words, our home and native land, those who believe the book of Genesis is about two chosen peoples who rubbed two sticks together on the plains of Abraham and gave fire to the world. Forget that other languages speaking people assimilate their very fucking souls to sound and think more English than the English and the Queen. Forget that they're actually aping the English Canadians who are aping the English. Forget that this has engendered an identity defined by a lack of one where those less equal cashed in their past and memories for one embraced and preached by those still living in a Victorian past. Forget that, forget all of that. Even if present day Toronto were made up of only English and Scottish stock. It's still a metropolis, Canada's largest. It's entitled to expect more from its theater critics with respect to Goldoni and Commedia dell'arte. True, it's also entitled to expect more from its theater artists where Commedia Craft is concerned, but feel blessed in their ignorance. It keeps you, well, where you are, employed. That we die is fear and inspiration enough to override and dwarf all other fears, or it should be, especially in the theater where life and death issues top all other themes. Fear of taking to task those who epitomize free speech, journalists, is plain stupid. And to miss out on democracy, 
And doing so is no way a mark of courage. Far from it. Perhaps I underestimate my colleagues. I mean, true, some actors might challenge critics, you know, directly, in aggressive, offensive ways, threatening to settle the score in some dark alley. In those cases, craft is hardly the point and virtually irrelevant. You know, it's about something else. But most actors, I believe, keep their feelings and thoughts to themselves, even when they wish they'd done otherwise and should have. In the Toronto Life article on you, Richard, the populist, only one actor, Albert Schultz, was apparently brave enough to go on record. No other actor, director or theater person in town would sign their name to what they had to say about you as a critic. No surprise to me, the problem with theater and its lack of courage is in that statistic. This is not your fault or responsibility. But what if, Richard? The magic if, you know, children are masters in this, you know? Actors thrive on what if. The magic if is the gateway, the pin number to the creative gold mine locked in the unconscious. What would you tell those silent actors, Richard, if they were your children? What do we do, Papa? Go on the record or do we no comment our way to hell? You know, there are really only two choices. They talk or they don't. They take action or live in fear. And imagine that between their question and your answer, Richard, a shower of bombs, an army of tornadoes, a hundred Mount St. Helens, devastate, shock and awe, everything and everyone around you, like the little girl in the photograph, screaming in fucking agony from the jelly gasoline, coating her entire naked body and burning through her fucking skin and muscle, right down her fucking bone, as she ran down the street towards the camera, looking like Christ, and yelling, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And add to this hell, Richard, your vision of hell. And imagine all of it. And imagine the only thing left is you and your children waiting for an answer. What would you tell them, Papa? And remember how they respond will be how they execute their craft, how they live their lives till the day they die. And that the template you give them will define humankind, the new world and democracy from this moment on. What would you tell them, Papa? For now we know what most actors have decided to keep their mouths shut. Una vita vista guerra. You know, maybe my father was right. We, my generation of we, haven't lived through a war or devastation on home turf. And our good fortune is our misfortune. I'm not saying that those who have are all enlightened in the same way. But children of war, like actors, all look the same, always bewildered, standing alone on piles of rubble, wailing, screaming terror and indictment, wondering how they got there, who put them there and why. And those who speak, if not killed, create their own destiny. Those who don't live in horror, live in a horror more hideous than the lowest hell and feed the beast of silence. You know, the Globe and Mail has recently revealed a defective gene that might actually explain this made in Canada silent cancer. In a tiny editorial, it condemned a junior public school for declaring martial law on its children. Complete silence at lunchtime, at least for the first 20 minutes. I mean, children as young as six were expected to sit in a sea of 350 pupils, eat lunch, say nothing, no lunchtime chatter, no playing, no nothing. In fact, do they have to eat at school, the school asked. Can't they go fucking home and eat and ex exercise in a quiet, calm environment? Because then the who's, young and old, would sit down to a feast and they'd feast and they'd feast and they'd feast, 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 feast! And then all the who girls and boys, they'd rush for their toys, all the noise, the noise, 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 noise! And if a child, if a child makes a run for it, go ahead, kid, make my day. Lunch and recess, I mean, Jesus, sacred for children, where play is the thing, where children build social and language skills. No, fuck that, where they play, just that, play and teach us. The take home message, children are to be seen, not heard. And that with this, the public school has reverted back to a Victorian era. And that's where I lost the globe, back to a Victorian era, back. You know, there's a giant billboard in Canada. Everyone's great when they're half dead. You know, I thought they were talking about a new show on Global, but apparently it's a prerequisite for primary school and theater. Yesterday's children are today's professional actors, and they owe their present-day silence to early education in a society that likes to see them but not hear them. That's why only one actor in a population of three million went on record, Richard. By wind, you know the climate. By mouth, you know the person. As is the face, so is the heart. Silent. Fear the man who feels himself a slave. He'll want to make a slave of you. Obedience is the great multiplier of evil. But they can smell, Richard. That's right. A Toronto city coroner apparently would enter a crime scene where a body lay rotting and smelling, and he would inhale deep breaths as if taking in the freshest, most exquisite fragrance ever. You know, police fainted at the sight or ran for the door to a bucket. The Iron Man, they called him. He loved children. That was the worst, children, especially the little girl found in a freezer in the annex. Did he actually love the smell? No, he hated it as much as anyone, but he refused to ignore it was there. He worked with death, but was married to life till the day he died. He studied death to help the living, his quote. 
Actors, like the coroner, can smell the climate. They don't have to see every production to know that theater is rotting and that no fancy wig, period costume, kaleidoscope set, lights, lighting or review, anything will mask the stench, even with two fingers stapled to their nostrils. And if you see it differently, we live in different worlds, go to different parties. I mean, after all, we're not in Quebec, you know, where people discuss plays and culture on subways and city buses, where cash counters and supermarkets are stacked to the ceiling with the dregs of their own culture, not someone else's shit. But if you ask Quebecers, they will tell you that they're in a crisis culturally as well. I mean, if they're in a crisis, where are we? And to those Argo fan-inspired think tankers, you know, quick to point out that Quebec has a linguistic advantage, that Australia is culture protected by distance, and that the English Canada is in the 49th parallel up to its neck and drowning in it, I offer this Calabrian saying, those who can't see are full of shit because they keep stepping in it. I have nothing to gain by writing this letter, except what we all gain. I would hope your interest in the process of theater stretches beyond the expedient straitjacket custom of cultural stereotyping, your assertions to the contrary, and cultural backgrounds notwithstanding. I mean, I'll assume that deep down you welcome this challenge. Maybe you're just embracing an opinion held by a former colleague of yours. You know, did I say Ray Conalog? Who in 1990 refused to print an outsourced theater review paid by the Globe on the grounds that it was too intellectual for the readership, as if the readership were made of one generally dense person he knew on a first-name basis. <laughs> The review was not intellectual, just out of grasp of Conalogue's understanding. Conalogue's narrow view of the Globe and Mail readership was the point. His attempt to strangle the theater piece and review sprouting out of a non-mainstream community was also the point. And in sharp double standard contrast to his ass-licking adulation of most foreign productions at the Toronto International Theater Festival. I hope you don't think the Globe and Mail and the Star readership cannot handle weightier, more knowledgeable reviews on Comedian Goldoni and that you offered what you thought it could handle and you held back the rest. My guess is that you wrote what you knew, all of it, hence this letter. If my ancestors, all poor ignorant fools, could speak from the grave, they would kill you with their bare hands for your abuse of the pen, that most precious gift, knowledge and weapon you hold in your fucking hands. But I think you knew what your pen was doing. You know, like those who commit crimes in order to get caught, hoping to postpone their next crime? Well, I answered your call. The director of The Amorous Servant. You know, if you as critics are family, this director is closer. I've known him for over 20 years. We even did a couple of plays together. An intelligent man with a huge and compassionate heart. He has great admiration for actors, young and old. Very supportive of people's work and talent, mine included. One of the most supportive people in the theater period. You know, one of those who... When young actors come to town, he stands at the gate and welcomes them, you know? It's not easy to talk about someone you know and like, who, like you, is trying to find a reason and purpose, an action that will say, hey, I was here and this is what I had to offer. But he lacks the craft and tools for directing a comedia play of any period in any style. This is a fact, one I've shared with him with sensitivity and tact, of course. His caring nature and genuine humanity deserve no less. And please don't gloat. He's not the only one. He's just taking one for the team, like you, like me. And the director's reasoning and position from the beginning was that this was not a comedia play in the traditional sense, a refrain echoed in his program notes and by most critics. You know, like most Canadian theater directors, he quotes from the right books, articulates what a writer was attempting to say or do with this or that play, talks about the historical, theatrical importance of the piece at the content and style level. But one expects bookish knowledge from a theater historian, not from a theater practitioner. At a practical craft level, the director is like most Canadian theater directors. He believes a play is a play is a play is a play is a play. You know, it all just plays, you know. As long as the emotion in comedy is real, even in comedy, very real, yikes. Even in a Goldoni play, yikes. It's just a play, Tony, like all the other plays. You know, it kind of directs itself, you know what I mean? That's why the director chose to direct it and why he thought he could. By the way, directing oneself is most Canadian actors' other profession. <laughs> and has been for many years. The best compliment Canadian actors accord most directors is, he didn't do too much damage. <laughs> There is no traditional or less traditional comedia where craft is concerned. We have a short history and therefore memory in Canada. Consequently, anyone with any theoretical knowledge of Europe's rich theater history must be a theater expert and is automatically given the keys to the car, a Chauncey Gardner of the theater. I like to watch, is Chauncey's refrain. Those around him filled in the blanks and they took him for more than what he was. Voila, our theater history in a nutshell. And we all lose, even the director of the Amherst Servant. I mean, I like to watch, too. From where I was standing, the theatrical experience of the amorous servant, if I can call it that, was the ideal solution to an insomniac's worst nightmare never to sleep again. The 30 or 40 people who yawned in unison at 
the first second of intermission confirmed the production could put a number of pharmaceutical companies out of business overnight. You know, catching up on one sleep is a great idea, but not during a play. The line between a sleep clinic and a theater production should be a little clearer. You, Richard, were there the same night. You and I were sitting next to each other, separated by an aisle. We practically had the same angle. I lost sight of mine, overpowered by spurts of deep slumber. I certainly don't blame the actors for any of it. You both did. Surviving a Canada in 1985, where we butchered a Moliere, organically reshaped it into an existential nightmare, 12 actors looking for an exit. I flew to Rome to a sea of tombstones and mausoleums where in the basement theater, I met a Canadian master, sat beside him, asked forgiveness, and listened. And then I fucked up. I asked him if he'd like to direct Pirandello's six characters in search of an author in Toronto. Hey, you think I'm a fool? I can't. I don't know anything about psychological drama. I mean, I know the play very well, but not at a craft level. Psychological drama demands specific tools. I don't have them. Well, I suggested he move to Canada, where directors rarely study directing, but direct just about every play ever written in the theater and in every possible style. <laughs> I mean, I was joking, of course, about him moving to Canada. Certainly not about the lack of qualified theater directors in Canada. I was stunned. He's a fantastic director, I said to myself. He can direct anything, and yet he's not jumping at the opportunity. I mean, you want to see some Canadian theater directors at work before they get the work? You go wherever they sell jewelry on the street. Yeah, look for the black coats, you know. You know, I've always wondered, why do directors wear those long, black, 19th century nihilist type coats, you know? And some of those coats, you know, they come with a beard, and you know, well-manicured beard like priests and earrings and piercings and stuff, you know? You know, what are they fucking doing with those coats and those fucking earrings and stuff? What is it? Even in the summer, 95 degree weather, blistering hot, and they fucking wear those long black coats. And so I watched. I stood across the street and watched one on Queen Street at work. Psst, come here. I got classics here, contemporary on this side. You know, foreign plays, always an interest in that. You know, take your time, okay, man? I got a restoration I can give you in two weeks. You, you give me cash and I'll do it in one and a half, okay? I can get two actors from out of town for scale minus 10%. Guy won a door, she lost one. Hey, but I'm betting she'll get one soon, okay? And they'll do it for nothing. They're dying to do anything, man. I can give you a Shakespeare, a couple of shots. You want comedy? There's this really funny actress from out of town, okay? She's chomping at the bit, man, you know? She's not emotionally stable, but she's emotionally deep. You know what I mean? She's on Shaw, Stratford, that other place in the fucking walkie, man. She can't act. She can act sometimes, dance, you know? She's not my kind of beautiful, you know, but she clicks with the audience, you know what I mean? And I'm saying, you can have her. You, she is yours. I mean, we're like this, okay, me and her, you know, she trusts me. So trust me, it'll cost you. And if you want to throw in a fucking comedia, fuck, you know, I got this great mask guy from such and such a place, we can get so-and-so from that other fucking place. So let's go experimental route, man, you know? Maybe throw in a fucking monkey wrench in the whole fucking thing, see what happens, okay? I mean, hey, it's fucking theater. My God, you know, I was humbled by my comedia master's commitment to craft. He didn't demean Pirandello by bringing it down to his level of understanding so he could justify directing it. A talent most Canadian directors have in spades. He acknowledged instead his limitations as a director at that moment in time, in that form. I had never seen that before in a director and have seldom seen it since. By that yardstick, I thought, how many directors do we have in Canada? The frightening realization that half jack of all trades directors flooded the Canadian theater scene was hard to digest and reconfirmed almost every time I did another play. A couple of years ago, I did listen to Six Characters in Search of an Author on CBC Radio Drama, translated by an Italian-Canadian and soaked in stiff upper lip ersatz English accents with Canadian actors. Dave Stad, Pontevecchio, old boy. Dave Stad, Dave Stad, Dave Stad. I was appalled and confronted the CBC Radio producer. He said, what? You want them to speak with Italian accents, Tony? And I said, no. They could have spoken Canadian English and drawn our attention to the story instead of boring us with pretentious Englishness, even the English in England find offensive that actually got in the way of the story and its meaning. Well, Tony, it's a Shaw production, you know, directly from the stage, very little I could do about it. And that was that, I mean, that is that. Not too long ago, I discovered a well-known Polish director had directed that Shaw production of six characters. And I was absolutely, well, no words. A few Toronto theater directors eagerly attended a lecture by George Ostreller some time ago and were stunned by the master's admission that he controlled, meticulously selected and designed all aspects of production, actors, sets, costumes, lighting, with the aid of, not deference to designers, to execute his vision. And that with the total control came the responsibility for everything that happened on stage. Though I respected Streller's eloquence and well-articulated craft knowledge, what I found equally interesting, perhaps more interesting, is that those present walked away with the word control, resounding and swirling in their brains like some magic potion that had suddenly turned merely incompetent theater directors into mass murderers, having in a sense, and in their own minds, renewed their license to kill theater and those working in it. And that predictably, the word responsibility had been left behind on the cutting room floor of the lecture room. 
mean, in Europe, people study a theater craft a lifetime and then perhaps teach it a day or two. In Canada, we study a theater craft or a play a day or two and then teach or direct it for a lifetime. If surgery in Canada were practiced the way we practice most theater, patients would be constantly leaving the operating room in Ziploc bags headed for the morgue. Patients would actually prefer to find a way to hang themselves before they got to the OR, knowing that what awaits them there will be worse. No, 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 I don't want to go. No, I want to die. I don't want to go. I don't want to see the doctor. No, no. That's the time I don't want to You know, actually, a hospital is not a bad idea. You know, we should all get sick. Really sick. You know, the kind of sick that leaves no room for metaphors. The kind of sick that puts you in a ward beside someone else who is equally sick, where who you are, what you do, and what tomorrow brings no longer makes sense and may soon be a thing of the past. That kind of sick, not quite death, but close enough to feel like it, where the only common denominator is the ward you're in and the sick person beside you, each person sleeping at a different time, each privy to the other's loud snoring and restless demons, where each moment feels like forever, filled with clarity and nothing else, when we're most likely to take things in, no resistance, the only thing worse than an audience member sleeping, though that's probably the worst, is a director sleeping during rehearsal. It happens. It happened to me. Am I proud of as an actor? Probably not. But no, but I, I wasn't acting. I mean, I started to act with the other actors, and like clockwork, the guy... <clears throat> we stopped and watched him in silence, wishing we were privy to his dreams and wondering if he was afraid of the dark and needed a couple of actors lullabying him to sleep with their craft. He wakes up an hour and a half later, looks at the stage manager. He says, that was okay for me. He says, how was it for you? She nods, that was good for me. Okay, good. He acknowledges the nod, looks at his watch and calls it a day. On his way home, he calls the TTA to find out if they're still a member of the theater company. Why, yes, is the reply. Why do you ask? Well, he says, I was sitting there in rehearsal watching those actors work, and I thought, my God, you know, what if we haven't paid our membership and don't qualify for a Dora? I mean, those actors are spilling out their guts there on stage, and it's not fair to them, God damn it. It's not fair for them, God damn it. Relax, sir, you're paid up. And it's so wonderful to see how much you care about your actors. Well, one of those actors one day asked the director a question about the scene and the play, like, what's it about? The director accused the actor of giving him a heart attack and then proceeded to have one. Back from the hospital with a stack of mint teas by his side and a tower of books on cholesterol, lean meats and vegetables, he sits closer to the stage manager than before, she holding his hand, keeping an eye on his pulse, while on book for the actors, the new tempo rhythm relying heavily on his frail heart. The director, of course, is happy to be back to rehearsals and everyone's happy to see him, you know, awaiting his State of the Union address, you know, and looking like Pope John Paul during his last years. He says with diminished strength, can we just run it, run it, run it, run it, run it, run it, run it. We'll deal with questions another time. Time, 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 time. Actors think, run what? But not wanting to affect his heart rate, they tea party their way through the play. Everyone is happy, like an Eaton's catalog. I'm not putting down Canadian theater directors. I've worked with a number of them. The intelligence is there, of course. Even the young, trendy directors who spend way too much time in front of a mirror manicuring their beards and egos and way too little time looking into themselves. Very intelligent. It's their reluctance to acquire fundamental theatrical tools that is difficult to understand. Intellectualizing often replaces craft knowledge. It robs a play of its inbuilt theatricality, creates a performance in the minds of the director and actors, and disengages an audience to the point of exclusion. Actors lament the state of theater in almost every dressing room of every theater in this country. And they cry the pain of missed and squandered opportunities in every bar from St. John's, Newfoundland to Victoria, BC, after almost every rehearsal and performance. Plays get blocked. Actors get blocked, theater is choked, and the audience can't breathe. I mean, it's bad enough for your average run-of-the-mill kitchen sink type, type drama. It's death for a comedia play. The director, traffic and blocking specialist or self-ordained genius, as a rule, pre-blocks the play in his or her head without the actors. In an art form dependent on actors, the director decides to do this, her most important work, exploratory work, without them. On the second day of rehearsal, the director instructs the actors to say the lines, move here, then there, not to block the other actors while simultaneously and surreptitiously working on his or her memoirs behind the wall desk he, she shares with the ever so attentive and obedient stage manager who records the actor's traffic and moving violations with the precision of a radar gun. On opening night, the director expects the actors to connect with the audience, okay, for a live evening of theater while the actors do their best to prepare for and survive the evening and the run. At five minutes to curtain, the actors think how ridiculous it all is, scrambling like fools on opening night, opening day rather, to find cards and gifts for their colleagues and trying to come up with inspiring words for an uninspiring three-week rehearsal period just before their first entrance they thank each other to death or avoid doing so altogether knowing the experience is just about to get worse in front of a live audience 
And then through sheer desperation and talent, they pull one out of the bag and say the director's asked in the process. See Peter Brook's shifting point. Meanwhile, the director has taken the fire exit to his or her next gig or sweats by the lobby bar, you know, waiting for the post line up show, line up of handshakes, an insincere course of, hey, well done, hey, that was great, man, wow, you know, while rehearsing his acceptance speech, you know, positive thinking to him or herself that this will be the year of the Dora, you know, not the fucking door. And the actors sit in the dressing room, dazed, not wanting to come out, realizing for the hundredth time they don't need to read Dante's Inferno if they haven't. They're living it. If this is not death on stage, if it's not Brooks' description of deadly theater, I don't know what is. Two minutes, please, or 15. Notwithstanding that what I fundamentally do is theater, that the theater is the most congenial medium for Italians, and that in the theater I feel like a little boy in a church who wants to become a priest, I didn't go to the theater and continue not to go. I enjoy being in the wings or on the stage, but it bores me to death to be in the audience. Federico Fellini. You know, the wise man goes suggested I use Anina wrote a piece as background to Fellini's comment, you know? I could have killed him right there and then, this son of a bitch, if he, were, if he weren't already fucking dead. You know, I told him that if he didn't get letter one, there was a good chance that fewer than I thought would get it would actually get it. He tried to comedy his way in, you know, but there was no room for him in this space. And he resented that. And he said, you know, he'd have to protect himself from me from now on. Went on about the fact that he's sad that he's followed me to here. And he feels that he's spiraling and spiraling and spiraling down and down and down. And he doesn't know where it's going to end. He wants no part of this. He feels like a blind man in a forest, like Gloucester without eyes. You know, I felt like plucking them out for him right then and there, the son of a bitch so he can think about the weight of what he says. And he left, and in that moment, I could only see everything that I hated in him. He's a devil, he doesn't even know it. If a person can't be silent for a minute with the sole purpose of listening to the sound of their own death, that's the devil. This hell is, just is. My God, you know, that's funny. Why would I say my God when I'm in hell? How do I know he's mine? And if he is, what am I doing here? What have I done? An Italian jazz ghost, you know, I absolutely love and respect, tells me letter one really gave it to those bastards, the enemy, the one he's been taking it from all these years, the one who remind him that he was born here, but not his parents, and so he can always lease, but never own. How could he have missed my point? You know, before I had the time to take it back and reshape it, he ran away with it. And only he and God knows what the hell he's gonna do with it. And during intermission, the philosopher ghost said he canceled a meeting with his son tonight so he could hear the rest of this. He said that what I had said in the first half makes him want to say it all over again with a gun. Watch your back if you know him and if he hates you. But he'll look you in the eye before he kills you. You know, this philosopher ghost hasn't been the same since he shared a conversation with an ex-prime minister on a flight to L.A. I won't mention her name. <laughs> the moon on one side of the plane and Haley's Comet on the other. So this philosopher ghost is a stickler for detail. He describes the dismal landscape of our culture practically resting his soul on the ex-prime minister's shoulder. As the plane lands in the city of angels, she, the ex-leader of our country, says, you know, when I land in L.A., I feel like I'm coming home. Ow! The Ph.D. ghost attacked me. Stop it, Tony, stop it. Don't f forget this hell, Tony. I don't get this hell, Tony. What is this hell? Forget Dante's hell. What Dante's hell? This is our hell. And she repeated her refrain from letter one. Tony, I'm repeating my refrain from letter one. Everything can't be equally important, but everything is connected. I said, no, no, I'm talking as a producer now, Tony. Then produce! Call the other ghost, Tony, please, okay? They'll tell you, you, you know, you're straying. You're losing it, Tony. Talk to someone. And so she dials a number, then another one, then back to the first one. She doesn't want to speak for the other ghosts, she says, but they've got great notes for me, and I should listen, and suddenly I'm like in Rosemary's Baby. But the ghosts were too wary of the pen glued to my hand, but she kept dialing like a manic depressive and saying, okay, get to the comedian, Tony. Forget the critics, Tony. Get to, get to where you're going, Tony. And did you call a lawyer, Tony? What about the lawyer? Oh, how my pen would like to kill you, bitch, without spilling ink, but only your fucking blood. May they grind you into sausage meat, if you need to know. I mean, this pen in hell is smaller but sharper. I'm getting used to it, you know? Where was I? Ah, oh, but it bores me to death to be in the audience, Federico Fellini, without Nino Rota music! You know, boredom in the theater is obviously not strictly a Canadian concern. We're just better at it than most. 
at a banquet, an editor of the Canadian Theatre Review made me an offer to edit an entire issue on directing. She was sober. <laughs> I can't do what I said, but I'll do it on one condition. The issue must carry the headline, no directors in Canada. She was stunned. Not to worry, I said. Those who are directors won't be insulted. Only the majority who aren't will be. <laughs> Most directors I've shared this with agree. You know, she agreed with me too. She just didn't know what public face to give it. A one-way ticket conversation to nowhere, our home and native land. And so I regaled her with more stories about watershed theatrical experience. A number of years ago in Toronto, a director at the largest theater in the city, did I say Canadian stage? <laughs> Thought the mark of success of De Filippo Saturday, Sunday, Monday was if the audience could smell the ragu in the theater, Tony. Go to a restaurant, I told him. Actually, we're gonna fucking restaurant. You'll have all the ragu smell you need. You know, while I want them to be able to smell the garlic, Tony, as if sharing a groundbreaking performance template, you know, like this was his response to uh, E equals MC squared, you know? I mean, where the fucking, where the hell is Vincent Price when you need him, you know? I'm sure he would have come up with a fucking some contraption, a barrel or a vat with garlic juice to drown this idiot in so his flesh and soul could be pickled in garlic since he liked it so much. So maybe then he can get on with directing the fucking play for a change. You know, it was the janitor, you know, a janitor, a Neapolitan who called me aside one day in the theater. Psst, psst. Half hiding in the broom closet. Tony, come here. You know, I got to think about closets and confessionals. You know, anyone who conducts business in a closet is someone who knows it's not okay to conduct that business outside of it. I was right. Tony, I saw the run through yesterday from the balcony. I have some notes. I look at them and go, hey, these are good. I took the notes of the director who thought they were great and might someday, you know, like come in handy, you know, if he ever decides to do the play again. You know what I mean, Tony? And this director was one of the better ones. I mean, if there was ever a time to line up director and actors against a wall and shoot them with tomatoes, I mean, ragu, that was one of them. And I was one of them actors. I mean, after that show, you just didn't, you know, you just didn't leave the theater through the stage door. Are you crazy? I mean, you put on some tights, a stocking over your head, you scale the walls of the building, hit the roof, travel a few blocks by long jumping every building or two, risking your fucking life. And when you're sure the person you might meet on the roof is more dangerous than the one you might meet on the fucking street, you hit the sidewalk and you run, you run home! hoping you don't run into some Italians who saw the show. I mean, it's one thing to see footage of Mussolini, an entire country practicing corner kicks with his head. It's another thing to be that soccer ball. But when you play by the ragu, you die by it too. A very gifted Italian-Canadian writer wrote me a letter. They got it wrong, what I said. The ragu on stage, Tony, the recipe's wrong, as read by that actor. You know, the goateed ghost had an explanation for the mediocrity afflicting our gifted directors. Well, no funding for directors, he said, as if directors' brain cells were equal to the money they got. You know, this really made me angry. And with the directors on this one, you know, little did I know then that the lack of direction was due to lack of funding. Fucking janitors, I thought. Why are the janitors getting all the fucking theater funding? <laughs> Look, Tony, who cares what the actors go through? If you want to talk about the problem, talk about the problem, Tony. The problem in this country is that they don't fund directors, and the playwrights are funded and funded 10 versions, you know, and they like it that actors give them feedback because they get more money for each version. Every actor has their opinion, and they destroy the play. And too many dramaturgs, Tony, you understand? My problem is that it's going to sound like a rant, you know, that Quebec does it better, you know? I actually wouldn't mind if Quebec separated, Tony. I think they fucking should, okay? Get their own fucking passport. I love Quebec, Tony. You know, they have their own culture, language. Let them go, Tony! I would love to visit Quebec as a tourist, Tony. Beautiful place, but do you think it's better for actors in Italy, Tony? Do you know what Antonioni said about actors to Jack Nicholson? You are nothing minions! And you know what Fellini? He has more stereotypes in his film story than anyone else. Do you know that, Tony? And do you know that he never gave actors a script, Tony? Actors in Italy are minions, Tony! Fucking minions! You wanna try Minuchkin in France, Tony? You can't even fucking pee! You gotta suffer, do you understand me, Tony? You can't fucking pee! And I've got a headache, Tony! I'm mentally exhausted! 90% of what you fucking say bores me, bores me! And people are gonna fall into a deep coma because it's like everybody does it right and English Canada does it wrong. Fuck Quebec, Tony! They lost the fucking war, the English won the war, and fuck the Jews, they killed their own! Und it leben haben aber Deutschland! Wow. <laughs> Better than anything I can write. Like Agent Smith, this Merovingian, this fucking devil that reappears in other bodies, maybe even in mine. I mean, if the miscreants of the fallen angels of the Second World War can be officially forgiven and are from time to time, if pedophiles and predators can have their records wiped out from the records, these directors will have, oh, they'll retire with an order of Canada at the very least. You know, the thing is, it's very hard to tell who knows and who doesn't. Directors of all stripes and colors use the same language, like politicians. Take this. The time is now ripe for us very seriously to consider how best we can ensure that there is a permanent return to a sense of unity, freedom, and liberty. In Uganda, 
No problem with that. By eating him in. Ah. You know, language can travel one way while actions go the opposite way. Our theater agrees on one thing, the language we use to describe what is, what should be, and what could have been. Then there's reality, the experience, and the... I mean, people, even infants, make the long trip to Canada from faraway countries for open heart surgery and transplants because of our outstanding surgeons and facilities. Why on earth should we not bring over the best directors available to bring a comedia play to life? Would we attempt surgery on anyone without knowing at the very least what our, our counterparts and the rest of the world know about surgery? Would we purposefully reject knowledge on the art of surgery from foreign surgeons so we could distinguish ourselves as Canadians? Would we not look for the best doctor to save the life of a loved one or our own? A cafe owner in my hometown refused me an espresso at 6 a.m. because the machine was acting up, you know, not behaving well. Something to do with the humidity outside. You know, I really didn't care this man's special relationship with his machine. I wanted my coffee now. Well, he was trying to fix the problem, he said, and he began to play with the many dials on the manually operated machine. Oh, I guess those dials do serve a purpose, I remember thinking. And he played and played around, and as I got more impatient, and he tried everything in different time, you know, you know, the grind, the pressure, this and that. I had to wait half an hour watching him throw away 30 espressos until he got it right. Oh, I got it, he said, I got it, I got it. I drank it in my North American time as money way. It was great. You know, and then it hit me and I thought, how do you teach this in books? You know, I told him in America, he would have made a bundle with the coffees he threw away. He couldn't understand that. He said, a coffee has to be just right. What's the point in drinking it? We do it for everyone, not just for you, you know? I mean, only in Canada do we prefer to defend ignorance of craft as a national characteristics. You know, I don't get people's obsession with being Canadian while simultaneously trying to be something they're not, especially those working in the theater especially as an excuse or justification for carte blanche ignorance or the, and their quasi-constitutional right to blame anyone outside of themselves for the lack of a vibrant culture. If the culture is vibrant, it'll be there and it will shift like life. Do what you gotta do when you gotta do it no matter what you do, it'll be Canadian. You can't take that away from and out of the picture even with a foreign director or play in the picture. The actors carry who they are, where they live in their DNA the way writers do. Hemingway could have written 20 novels about Iceland while living in Iceland, and his fiction would still be American. Yes, one's culture is important, and so is finding one's voice. Let's tell our stories. The more, the better. We need to do more, but we tell our stories even when we do Ibsen, Chekhov, Shakespeare, Goldoni. To pretend we don't is idiotic. If we can't do justice to the classics by making them fresh and relevant, we are not giving expression to our voices and fooling ourselves and thinking we fare better with new works. The opposite is also true. The problem with one is the problem with the other. In a triplet of theater festivals in Ontario, enjoying relative or at times great success does not reflect the reality in the country as a whole. I mean, who says no crisis in sight when it comes to the classics? Who says? The Canadian theater proves quite masterful at adapting and staging works from world repertoires. Who says we are becoming better known as interpreters of other people's stories than originators of our own? Who? You, Kamal. Astounding, absolutely astounding, you know? I mean, I mean, I believe you have shrunk intentionally or unconsciously the definition and field of the classics for the purpose of your end of the year report card. It seems the classics are mainly plays by English authors with the exception of those two eternally English laundered Penguin Classics authors, Chekhov and Ibsen. So when you say masterful and better known, how relative is your relatively speaking? And what is your definition of success? Any suggestion that we excel with the classics where we fail with new works ignores the level of craft that went into writing the former and the all too often lacking in the latter. And if actors at times fare better in classics, it's because they have better material to work with. This does not mean the productions per se are more accomplished. I happen to think our classical theater is still in a pre-centennial colonialist mindset. Quebec's two largest flagship theaters are not the Racine and Moliere festivals. That is a country. And I'm not a separatist. Theater in Canada in general is irrelevant in spite of its popularity. It's a going to the theater hall, side dish status symbol, and has pretentiously embraced and practiced by small theater companies claiming they're humankind's answer to the big musical plague. I mean, when it comes to McDonald's and prostitutes, people generally agree their popularity does not imply quality of life. When it comes to theater, numbers suddenly justify quality. We build theaters to feel civilized, to watch ourselves in the act of being civilized. We, the Canadian we, 
are authentic in one thing and one thing only, our ability to be constantly, consistently, and organically inauthentic. We believe we brought in the definition of who we are by not being who we are. You know, like genuine leather, we should stamp genuine inauthentic on every Canadian ass. No more passports. It'll be hard to get used to watching 30 million people drop their pants whenever they're asked to declare who they are. But at least, you know, the stamp saves you the trouble of having to explain why you're exempt from being who you are. You know, how's your meal, sir? Man gets up, drops his pants right there in the restaurant. Genuine and authentic. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have asked, sir. I apologize. I, it won't happen again. Enjoy your meal. The guy dies of food poisoning. You know, anything wrong, sir? The guy shakes his head, points to his ass. In the rest of the world, The Amorous Servant is a classic. What is it here? A press release. A delightful and moving comedy filled with grande passione. You know, welcome once again to the Starbucks of theater, where a thing is not a thing, but something else, where the fake often replaces and becomes the real. Takes me back to the good old days, 1982, when a plate of pasta al burro on Young Street near Bloor cost 11.95, and people stood in line like at a concert. Maybe they thought it was some rare dish like pasta with donkey meat or served by a mule. Un burro, un burro, por favor. España por un burro, un burro al dente. Gotta have it. And the fact that you couldn't get in meant you wanted in even more. Then they realized it was simply overcooked catelli penne with cheap butter, what my father made for lunch for us kids when my mother wasn't home to cook. Not to look stupid, they paid their bill, overcomplimented the chef with grazie molto bene, molto grazie, grazie, and left, hoping they weren't vibrating banjo music on the way out. <laughs> the restaurant died soon after, but cashed in while it could. This distinguished approach to cooking can still be found in most theater practice and reviews. Grande Passione Productions become the standard by which subsequent comedia productions are judged. The bar is set in hell's basement. We strive to take it lower still. I mean, what would a serious student of world drama get from this production that he, she couldn't get by reading the play, Mr. Uzunian? Please tell me. And what is world drama while we're on the subject? Is Chekhov not world drama, Bernard Shaw, Shakespeare? Do the Stratford and Shaw festivals not specialize in world drama? Would you ever think of telling people, go to Stratford or Shaw only if you're interested in world drama? Or I'm sorry, am I mistaken? You know, our Bernie and Bill, two guys from Sudbury who went to the British Isles to polish their trade, came back home, you know, with a stack of Canadian classics that Britain and Ireland are now trying to claim as their own? I get it, it's like the World Series. It's not really the World Series. You know, Shaw and Shakespeare are not really Canadian, but technically, yes, since we are, after all, the World Center for English Colonialism still today and through no fault of the English. So let's pretend Bernie and Bill are Canadian. Otherwise, we'd have to admit that our two largest English Canadian theater festivals specialize in world drama authors at the quasi-total exclusion of homegrown plays. You know, nothing wrong with doing Shaw or Shakespeare as often as we like, but we certainly don't develop our identity or voices by affecting phony mid-Atlantic penguin classics bullshit accents every time we perform Shaw or Shakespeare or any foreign play. It's our inability to connect our present-day tongues to those long-ago plays that produces the foul-smelling odor of our Canadian theater rubber tires spinning in vain in a century-thick layer of Victorian snow. It reflects our society's deep identity crisis and malaise, and Rideau Hall is our temple of contradictions. All in all, a funeral home offers more drama than most theater in this country, and we know it. <laughs> and we don't seem to have patience or the interest to ask why. We're too busy drafting out an identity. Draft 141. As for new works, new works, death by workshop, death by dramaturgy. No, death by dramaturgs. Or those who go by the name with little knowledge of the game. Dramaturgs know who they are. So let's talk about the other ones. No, no, I won't speak for them. I'll let one speak for himself. A popular professional dramaturg, no slouch, you know, who taught at York U, might still, don't know, I think he's at Stratford now, once gave me a play to read and said, hey, this play, Tony, is not like anything before it in the history of theater, man. You know, it does not do what other plays have done before it, he said. I said, fine, I've got all the time in the world. Let's start more or less at the beginning, Sophocles, Euripides, and work our way to Michelle Tremblay, George F. Walker, and let's not forget the Orient. Please tell me what each play and writer did or attempted to do and how this play is different. He looked at me and said, well, fuck, I don't really mean like that, Tony. Well, that's how you're presenting it. I said, well, you know what I mean. No, I don't know what the fuck you mean. That's why I asked. Well, you know, I thought of those students at York U having to listen to this drivel day in, day out, and I thought, God help them, you know? I don't know if he did, but I know the dramaturg certainly didn't. You know, I'm, I imagine he's re-articulated a dramaturgical language for himself since the 80s. I hope so. 
You know, he's the kind of guy you want, you know, for your taxes. You know, what I'm going to do with your taxes has never been done before in the history of taxes dating back to the Romans. You know, we look at them, we find the loopholes, and you never have to pay taxes again until the day you die, okay? But you're going to have to trust us, okay? You can't resist us. We're trying to help you, okay? So work with us. And so we know you trust us. We'll ask for only one thing of you. Give us your heart and mind, and it'll be there for you when you come back. Where am I going? I can just go on vacation as it relax for the rest of your fucking life. You know, we'll take care of you. Yikes. You know, most dramaturgs use another method. You know, what I like about your piece is that, man, you know, you're striving for that Brechtian and Beckett kind of thing where that thing they do, not that they do the same thing or that you're trying to copy them, but, you know, they're, they're nevertheless unique in their own thing, but you've taken that, all right, and you made it your own, and I think that that is your strength. <laughs> the writer reaches for a gun. He asks the dramaturg, are you the best there is? The dramaturg nods. The writer shoots himself. Canadian dramaturgs, at best, are like worst sex therapists. You know, okay, you're, you're not getting this, okay? So I'm gonna have to fuck your wife, watch me, because, you know, I'll only do it once, you know, I'm gonna fuck her for you, okay? <laughs> Orson Welles said, you know, Italy has 50 million actors, all of them great. There are only a few that are very bad, and they work in theater, film, and television. <laughs> you could have said that about any country in the world, I guess. You just happened to choose Italy for obvious reasons. And he knew Italy could take a joke. I mean, God knows they vote one in every once in a while. You know, Dario Fo said that acting in life by your average person is way superior to what we may find on stage. Agree. And that thought takes me right back to Canada. We have an overflowing supply of talented actors in this country. Unfortunately, the surgical knife is too often in the hands of unqualified directors who can't differentiate it from a kitchen knife. And there's little an actor can do or clarify in a preset climate of directomania and confusion. The actors and the amorous servant brought their talents to the theater. That should have been good enough for any qualified director and theater critic. But like the director, you masked your ignorance as knowledge. Worse, your ignorance in areas was used as a weapon against the actors. To cheap shot an actor in a review on account of your ignorance is offensive to every actor in the world and indefensible. For you, Richard, to ridicule ironically and unjustly the one actor who actually knew what she was doing, craft-wise, beggar's belief. I mean, I have the boss to say that notwithstanding your ignorance of community, you don't like a certain actor because, hey, you don't. That's fine. You have to live with your printed words even more than the person they might affect. You'll have to dance with them in hell. But don't attack the actor under the pretense you know more than she. The actress has a solid understanding of commedia. It was evident to anyone who knows anything about commedia. Their execution could have been stronger. That she did not have any support is another story. Not her fault. To you, though, she sounded like Carmela Soprano on a really bad day. Wow, you know, I'd love to know what you mean by the wrong kind of colloquial Italian. I'm no polyglot, but I'm fluent in three languages, can swim comfortably in a few Italian dialects as well. I was actually born and have worked in Italy. I still don't know what you mean. Please show us the right kind of colloquial Italian and how an 18th century matron sounds and behaves on a good day, a bad day, and pose menopause. Judging by the confidence in your comment, I think you can do it. And I think Tony Soprano would love to take you on a fishing boat, you know? Just you and him, if you know what I mean. Any comedian director in the world would have been ecstatic to have that actress in a production. You, on the other hand, decided to play rhythm to the director's lead guitar. Like Roman soldiers, you each took hold of one of her hands and nailed it to the cross. The director was totally unaware of it, still is. You flaunted it. Your picture in the Toronto Life story on you tells that story, Richard, holding an etu brute dagger in your hand, playing up, I guess, people's perception of you as a backstabber. I certainly didn't have that perception of you. Instead of letting the piece speak for itself, reveal your character, you or the photographer, hard to tell, had to tell the audience what to think. And think I did. I think you got caught in the very trap you couldn't see with the actors and the amorous servant. Like many actors, you suddenly found yourself playing someone else's monkey or decided to play the monkey before it was even suggested out of habit. Your adolescent type boast reminds me of a troubled Italian immigrant boy I used to know in Montreal who found thrill chasing Hasidic boys and cutting off their payas and tucking their scalps, as he called them, under his belt to see if he could collect more than his equally troubled friends. And by the way, I'm not a friend of the actress. I know her, hardly, mainly from a distance, and she probably would want to kill me for this, but I know her craft, and I've only seen her in two shows in 10 years, and you, from the beginning, there'd be little room for her in Toronto, and you proved it, and you chose to denounce her publicly as a heretic, as degenerate art. But it could have been worse, Richard. She could have been directed by you in a comedia play. And Kamal, your handling of another actor was also unfair, though in fairness, you didn't appear to be drafting out the actor's premature obituary. The actors were all lovely fish in a dental office aquarium, put there by the director, but they're not fish, and that sealed their fate. They couldn't breathe, and neither could we, watching them drown. 
that all the actors were forced to utter and trip on incomprehensible Italian words. You both called it as you saw it and were right to do so. You know, this was another brilliant Starbucks-inspired move by the director. He put the PR right into the body of the production. You know, things sell more if they sound foreign, like rent a goalie. And the daughter telling the father to go fuck himself in Italian without dramatic consequence. It's so cute when Italians do that, you know, to each other. You know, a throwback to the 50s live television, to that salesman-type character that pops up in the middle of a scene, you know, extolling the benefits of a laxative toothpaste or evaporated milk, you know, the sponsor. In this director's case, and in his head, the sponsor was Italia, all things Italian. And he made sure we wouldn't forget it. He even went door to door like a salesman telling the Italian community in Toronto that they needed this Goldoni to celebrate their culture, to better understand themselves. And could they please give him some money so he could tell them who they are and who Goldoni was? I too carry the scars of the evil I've dragged with me to this hell. In 1986 in Rome, I made a mistake I swore I'd never do again, you know? We, a couple of actors, took an actor, hung him like a goat, skinned him alive, and let him bleed. His crime? couldn't deliver the goods during rehearsal. The comedian master remained silent, refused to fire the goat. Once the show opened, Mauro, I'll never forget his name, gave the audience the best, purest five minutes of theater in that five and a half hour production. That's a director. The ability to help unleash the pure ability of actors by supplying them, young and old, with superb tools. The comedian master is not only a director, he's a first-rate actor as well. It makes a difference, big difference. That's when Simon Callow's 1984 manifesto shouts in your brain, unless a director enhances a direct relationship between writer and actor that has existed for hundreds of years, he, she should get out of the way, out of the theater. Goldoni, Shakespeare, Moliere, all actors would agree with Callow. Prove me wrong. If you can't, why can't you? What vital information would you require to prove me wrong? Oh, I see, the sources are dead. Incidentally, what source did you use for your opinions and assertions on Goldoni and Commedia? Dario Fo said the Commedia dell'arte should be changed to Commedia dell'attore. Actors bring the place to life with their craft and improvisational skills, even the most written plays. This from an actor who in 1997 received the Nobel Prize for literature for his written plays. Mike Alfreds of Shared Experience agrees with Fo. The actor is the most important element in theater, not the script. It helps if it's a wonderful script, even Shakespeare, but the life of the theater is in the living figures on stage. And Peter Brook, after a lifetime in the theater, where he initially embraced the Wagnerian ideal of total theater, where the director is super boss, as the auteur in recent years has shifted to the belief of an actor-centered theater, where the actor as human being standing before other watching human beings is the real embodiment of total theater. Until the director realizes that he's an outsider, that his role is peripheral, he cannot become integral to the theater. How many generations of Canadian actors must we see embrace the role of lab mice as they follow the self-appointed Moseses of the theater across the Red Seas to the promised lands of nowhere. I mean, fuck 1520 in Rome, Luther was preaching in a church, possibly questioning his role in it. A priest next to him said, come on, just get on with it. Well, Luther went back to Germany, wrote 95 theses, nailed them to the door of the church, and changed the course of Western history. These letters are nothing. To understand courage, Luther was 27, Michelangelo was painting the Sistine Chapel, Raphael decorating the Pope's private apartments, and St. Peter's whoring indulgences for its completion, and Luther farewelled all of that hopeless, blasphemous Rome, and he fucking got on with it. Canadian actors are told to get on with it daily, and they just get on with it. You know a Canadian theater scene when you see one. When actors whisper who they are and what they do, realizing there's no respect for actors in a country with no respect for culture, where theater posters for years, still now, list the names of set designers, stage managers, directors, their pets, hairdressers, therapists, at the total exclusion of actors' names. I mean, you may not know who's in the play, but hey, should you need a household pet, you know where to look for one. <laughs> you know actors are fucked when directors, who used to be actors, look at their new role as a promotion, as a step up in life and art, and that they're leaving something inferior behind. You know, it's actually about power. They feel they have a power they didn't have as actors. Now that they are directors, they come to a fork in the road, clearly marked where the choice will lead them. Run, ghost, run, one choice. This actor turned director sits in a spot, spots me and asks a question. Not sure whether or not I should answer it, I do, or start to, I'm immediately interrupted with, well, it seems to me, Tony, that you're idealizing actors. I'm lost, I mean, I know he's lost, but you know, I might as well be lost too. I mean, how the hell do I get him out of that black forest of literalness he calls home? 
You know, he tells me many actors don't know what they're doing. They're not all intelligent. Some of them actually have the gall, Tony, to disagree with the director's idea, and on and on and on. What about those actors, Tony? Is it not better that they check their intelligence at the door? Well, I point out that he's using one word to mean another. Intelligence does not mean ideas. Actors suggest ideas, usually for two reasons. Because there is no idea on the table, or because whatever idea there is or might be there is not clear, or, as is often the case, not articulated clearly by the director. I have yet to see an actor resist a clear idea by any director. It just so happens that the better the director, the clearer the idea. And then he throws me a compliment. Well, you're not like most actors, Tony, you know that. But having been raised in a Calabrian household where one is unaccustomed to compliments and therefore develops a healthy suspicion of them, and those who throw them around like flyers at a fucking front door, I don't fall for the trick, you know? He compliments in order to handcuff, blind and neutralize me, and I know it, you know? And so I tell him that actors are the same, from the youngest to the oldest, the greenest to the ripest, all of them the same, all of them able to understand, engage, and execute regardless of talent, and that he's looking at a condition instead of a cause. But the condition puts him in the middle of a story. He must go back to the beginning, to the start, in order to explain the middle. I mean, how can you say actors disagree with your idea if you're responsible for selecting those actors? Do you not select actors who share your idea, who are at least sympathetic to it? Well, there is a problem with the whole, you know, casting situation in the country, he tells me. And he says country like it's something outside of himself. And again, I tell him he patronizes actors. And now the temperature suddenly goes up. And I can see the fever-like red in his face. And he's late for an appointment. I'm late for two of them. My car has a $42 ticket. But I stay the course. And like someone having a difficult time dealing with exposed emotions and looking more and more like Bruce Dern in a fucking film, he mumbles, I don't fucking patronize actors, Tony. I do not patronize actors, Tony. I said, you are. He repeated it a second time, thinking it would have more effect on me, thinking he had used a different inflection, a more beware what you say tone. Probably the first acting he's done in a little while, you know. You know, holy, he wasn't acting. He was serious, you know, and he wanted me to know it. You know, I felt that if I had pushed him a little harder, not that I was being hard in any way, he would have cried right then and there. And he tells me how one day on a film, he told himself he would be who he was for just one week. And that if that was not welcomed, he would then do what he was told. You know, I wanted to ask him where he got the one week limit on authenticity, but he was on a roll, so I let him roll. Well, apparently he gave in after one week, but was called on the carpet by the producer who told him, hey, what happened? You were hired to bring your A game to the table. Well, the next day, that's what he did, but nobody wanted his A game. Not even the producer who had encouraged him the day before to bring his A-game to the table. Well, not all of my ideas were gold, Tony. You know what? Can't expect gold from me all the time. I interrupt him, telling him his remark was possibly arrogant because it implies he knows what golden ideas look like. Well, I stand corrected, he tells me. There's no right or wrong. You're right, he says. But that's when he knew he could not go on in the business as an actor. He could not be who he was. I told him I was sticking to my story. You patronize actors, including the actor in you. And before he had a chance to attack, I told him we probably have a different definition for actor. When I say actor, I mean the actor in every single human being in the world. The storyteller, the one able to weave magic in front of an audience because he, she loves weaving stories. The actor behind, inside the professional actor, inside every writer and director. I mean, he's thinking about the army of professional soldier actors he's had to work with, the infected army he once belonged to and hated. He left that condition behind, healed the wounds, apparently got himself a new condition. He's on this side now, he's thinking sides. He's no longer one of them, he's a general. And a general needs to get him into shape to make sure they walk in step and pay for what he paid for the dogs who barked at him as he went by. And he runs and ducks from his own shadow of fear. And you stand there with your hands, you know, your pants down to your knees, so to speak, and your heart on your sleeve for Dawes to peck at. The other choice is one bought with pain, with a life whose birth and beginnings tasted of death. The angels of the theater. I paid a visit to my cleaver stuck in the neck ghost, and there was a visitor, an angel. No phony angel, this ghost is for real. He's the one who called me 10 days after my father died to tell me my closest ghost had just tried to take his life and join my father and everyone else who went before. My 86 and a half year old father had tried desperately to stay in and lost. My 50 year old friend with still so much to give had tried desperately to end it, but survived. It's not that he hadn't tried. The fact he resented most of his adult life, especially the one surrounding his neck, gave him life when he had chosen death. My father certainly didn't get what he wanted, and he would have gladly have changed places with my friend. But then my friend had an angel, and angels are in short supply. Who is this angel? A director, also an actor. But first, one who loves life and theater, loves it so much he refuses to put himself in situations that encourage him to hate it. And he says, English actors are two in their head. 
I said, no, 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 they're not in their head enough. That's why you think they're in their head. When you're asked to leave your head at the door, you're caught. Your head is trying to fight, struggling to stay in. What can the actor do? He's being asked to stay in, but his head has been banished from the rehearsal and the theater. The actor is stuck. He can't remove his head, but pretends he left it at the door. Gridlock, traffic jam in the actor's head. That dynamic, that reality, that snapshot, that's what you saw. I told my French Canadian director, an actor fighting his own head on behalf of the director and then being accused of being in his head. Let his head live, let it stay in the room and the actor's body will follow and that will serve the play and the audience. And suddenly the angel takes me to Edmonton where producers gave him a schedule for a play he was about to direct. And he says, where's the theater? The producers were dumbfounded. Well, this is the schedule, you do the theater. No, no, I mean, where's the theater in your schedule? Actors have to live and life feeds the theater. If there's no room for life in the schedule, there's no room for theater, don't you see? Actors who don't feel like working because it feels like work, because there's no room for playing. Actors bored in the wings, just getting on with it, uh, show after show, and a few more to go, and then on to the next one. What is that? Well, we've been working this way for 40 years, sir. I mean, it doesn't bother us. I mean, are, are you okay? No, I will not adapt actors to a schedule. The schedule will have to be adapted to the actors, and the angel tore up the schedule. When the production was voted as one of the best in the world at the time, an acknowledgement for quality way above average, people wondered why. And they asked him, well, I, I tore up the schedule, he'd say. And those who heard thought he was withholding the secret and called him arrogant. <laughs> Poor them, he said. And he let it hang in the air. Poor who? Peter Brook, he said. Poor him? No. Poor them, he said. You mean Peter Brook? He nodded. About who? He said nothing. You mean English Canadian theater, I asked? He nodded. When? When I met him. Oh, poor you, I thought. And he cried. He said, if Canadian actors can create within this environment, Tony, imagine, imagine what they could do if they worked in an atmosphere of creativity and play. Quebec would be nowhere. For well, the great white father of Canadian theater had warned him one day, don't stop, don't ever stop being a Quebecois, especially outside of Quebec. Now that the great white father is dead, he knows what that meant. But the angel found that the situation in English Canada encourages just that, and he's right, I thought, you know. Anytime we say Canada in English Canada, we only mean English Canada. But the devil is never too far from the angel, especially the one inside the angel. And so the conversation came to children, and he says, children should be slapped around once in a while, Tony. The ego of a child can be evil. The child's heart must be protected from that. Well, without thinking, I unstuck the cleaver stuck in the neck of my closest ghost. That hurt him. He liked it there. And before I realized what I'd done, the angel was still standing before me, his head lying by his feet, his eyes in mid-sentence. And I gave the fucking cleaver back to my closest ghost. And I said, if this fucking angel can't see the connection between children and actors, what will the others do to them? And maybe this fucking angel didn't save your life back in March, but needed to save a fucking life to put it on his resume, staple it to his fucking ego. My closest ghost gently put the cleaver back into his neck, went to bed, and hugged it like a teddy bear. And I left the angel lying on the floor, dead. Nothing personal, I thought to myself. It never is, you know? And he was smiling, but a tear running down his face. Happy for what he gave to actors, the tear for what he didn't give to children. Actors with no heads, decapitated thespians, human ads for theater schools, producing more human ads for theater schools, the walking dead. These are the actors you took issue with, Kamel and Richard. You shot them when they were down, without a head, only their talent writhing in pain, and you fucking shot them! You don't need me to tell you the little courage it took you to kill them. I mean, not kill, but you know what I mean. Don't let the metaphor throw you. What is Camille de l'Arte? Fuck it, it doesn't matter, you know? I don't care at this point. I mean, I had pages and pages on its history that it's an acting technique, not a style. I'd risk putting people in a fucking coma, I was told, and so out it went. And all I have is the question, the challenge of condensing and building to climax. Careful not to rant, but stay in character, my character. Show my difficulty in expressing what is difficult to express. What is committed the life? Fuck it! Fuck it. Besides, I'm not into comedy tonight, you know? Not here. I give it some thought, you know, I thought if Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Jerry Lewis, Abbott and Costello, Jackie Gleason, Monty Python, on and on and on, you know, if they can't get to our two critics, why did I ever think I could even come close? But explain it, I did try, and now I regret it, you know, the good news is they wouldn't know what to do with those 17 pages I sent them. Oh, no, but you have to do some comedy, Tony, you know, that comedy coming out of all that hell, you know, funny moments are good, the humor is very important, ah, shut the, just shut, I don't even fight, shut the fuck up. Humor is very important, you know. Only in Canada do we have pharmacists working in the theater, you know? 
I can just see a Bolshevik or a Menshevik, a Luther or a Washington or a quiet revolutionary saying, hey, we're going to storm the Capitol. Okay, it's a revolution. It's not going to be easy or pretty, you know, but if we keep it funny, it'll be good. You know, humor is very important. A lot of people will be killed, so let's keep a fucking sense of humor about this, okay? Yeah, humor this. Where's Joe Pesci and Goodfellas when you fucking need him? You know, and the goatee ghost with, you know, I think your point, the comedia Tony, you know, performance template for improvised drama, 14th century, later the dramaturgical template for written plays. Very interesting, Tony. Serving both actor and writer. This binary function, extremely important. Ah, shut. Just shut the, shut the f up, up, shut. Why don't you just go to Afghanistan? The odds are in my favor. Binary function. Yeah, that'll wake him up in the fucking theater. Might even sell a Canadian tire, you know? Binary function, yeah, aisle 10, you know? Is that the Committee of the binary one? Yeah, 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 aisle 10. It'll flush out your bowels, give more room to your fucking diaphragm, more laughs. <laughs> You'll even choke on the fucking laughs. That's the one you mean? Yeah, aisle 10, go, top. <laughs> you wanna know something about fucking Committee? Don't go to, you know, don't go to your hardware store. Go to your local university or one of the fucking many celebrated acting schools. The risk of going to a hardware store is that you might actually learn something about Committee. You know, those who teach a talk style, even when they say they're not, no, no, no. An Arlecchino mask above their heads, you know, tells us they mean it, you know, they're serious. You know, they look at a book, build costumes, it says, that are historically accurate, design masks, or forget masks. Give actors some 17th century or 18th century exaggerated fucking courtly gestures, as if we know what the fuck they were. Spread a thin layer of improvisation atop, you know, disjointed gags, like the galloping gourmet. A sprinkle of Italian words and phrases here and there, like, Dovsta in Ponte Vecchio, old boy, no, 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 no. And voila, a dish old burro all over again. The Elephant Man is a story of one fucking man. A comedy production in Canada is about a company of elephant men. Wooden Pinocchios, you know, arthritic. Rebacks are setting their fucking asses off. And they give you a PhD in tenure for that. May the defendant rise, please. Your name? Uh, director. What do you do? Um, uh, direct. Would you like to be more specific? Oh, not really. I try to avoid that whenever I can. I think that's one of the problems. <laughs> Yeah, before we proceed, I would like to establish a couple of facts. Wine or beer? Uh, beer. Tim Hortons or second cup? Um, Tim Hortons. You do a lot of traveling? Oh, to the cottage, that's about it, Your Honor. You know, good thing my wife did most of her traveling before she met me. Do you know why you're in court today? No. You have been charged with malpractice, okay. Are you a Commedia dell'arte professor? Yes, sir. For how many years? 30. Well, here's some of the things that have been said about you, uh, some of the crimes, if you will. Uh, you have no understanding of the media or its genetic code and acting templates. Would you say this is a fair assessment? Yes, it is. Uh, you deny Goldoni's relevance? I think so. You fail to see the connection between comedia and jazz? I would agree with that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you believe comedia is an actor's technique? I agree. But blame the actors when it's not funny? Well, absolutely, it's their technique, not mine, Your Honor. But you teach it, yes, sir. Are you aware that Shakespeare, Moliere, Marvaux, and Bernard Shaw had all some solid understanding of this comedian Delarte technique? Did you know that? No, news to me, Your Honor, but thank you. I'll look into it, okay? Well, what do you read in preparation for your classes? Well, I don't do a lot of reading outside newspapers and magazines. You know, maybe the auto trader for trucks and heavy equipment. You know, I love driving trucks. You know, I love that. I just look, you know, price everything. But would you say that your students have been victimized in any way by your lack of knowledge? Oh, not a bit. You know, Your Honor, most of them have gone on to wonderful careers. And what? Well, teaching, Your Honor. They're absolutely wonderful comedian, Delarte teachers, man. Some even better than me. You know, more successful. That's how good they are, Your Honor. And I'm proud of that. I see. And we still see each other from time to time. You know, throw back a few beers, talk hockey, you know, that kind of thing. Any one of them actually doing this comedia thing profession? Oh, to be honest, Your Honor, not really. Any idea why? Well, you know, you just get so much from teaching it that, you know, doing it, you know, would be a letdown. <laughs> yeah, well, what do you think was the major problem with the production? Honestly, Your Honor, because that's, that's the only way I know how to answer a question like that. Yeah, I'm waiting. Well, Your Honor, the actors, okay? And I'm an actor's director, Your Honor, unlike those who say they are but aren't, okay? Hey, you can't get the actors you really want. It's like trying to buy fruit out of season. You get, well, you know, you get those you get, you know? They don't even want to work, you know? No, they stand there and they're waiting. I'm waiting for the move, wiggle, do something, and then finally words come out of their mouth. Where do you want me to move to? To a fucking mining town! It's unbelievable, Your Honor. I mean, I don't want to toot my own horn, Your Honor, but it takes fucking courage to stand up here and tell the truth. No, but you've been accused of moving actors around on stage for no real reason other than moving them around on stage. Well, no, Your Honor, to move them in that fashion was my intent. You know, it's a concept I've been working on and trying to articulate. But when you have a concept, you know, you can't bring it to fruition if you don't have the time or the funding, Your Honor. It's a question of funding. Oh, yeah, but you agree. You have only a vague understanding of this profession. Your Honor, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years. If I said 29 years, I'd be lying. Uh, what are you most proud of as, as a director? Well, I have to say, Your Honor, the 10 consecutive years in Canadians, who's who? Mm -hmm. Are you aware that comedians can serve dramatic pieces just so well? No, you're kidding me, Your Honor. Are you serious? I mean, what do you say to people who say that Goldoni did not abandon comedia and improvisation even after his reform? Nothing, Your Honor, not one thing. If you want to talk about reformation, I know so little about it, it's not even funny, Your Honor, so you might as well ask your next question. Fair enough. Well, apparently, no, you fail to see 
the inbuilt theatrical hierarchy in a comedian play. Is this true, reflected in the characters and their theatrical function? Is that a question, Your Honor? Yes, it is. Well, thank you, Your Honor. You know, it's questions like that that really make it complicated for the rest of us, you know? So I would have to ask you to rethink your question, ask it in a different way. You know, people are people, Your Honor! And I treat everyone the same. There's no hierarchy where I teach comedia. We're all in it together. I mean, would you agree? Absolutely not, Your Honor, no! I disagree totally. I mean, sorry, what's your question, Your Honor? No, I said, if I have a Goldoni here and a Moliere here, does the combination of strong text and improvisation lift the play, possibly the reason why these plays survive? No, absolutely not, Your Honor. No, no, I disagree totally. No, no, no. I mean, I, I would just have to disagree with that assessment. I believe my experience is quite the opposite. A text is a text is a text, Your Honor. That's why they call it that. Anytime you get messaged with the stuff, it sucks, okay? In fact, we usually cut out a lot of that stuff and concentrate on the Latsy. You know what I mean, Your Honor? I mean, that's what we're talking about, right? Latsy. I mean, you do a lot of improvisation with your students. A nightmare! And the thrill, the thrill being, when it's not a nightmare, Your Honor. I mean, there's just a lot of confusion about improvisation and comedy, Your Honor. It's like hockey, it looks loosey-goosey, but you gotta have tools, Your Honor. Well, how would you go about giving those tools to your students? It's tough, Your Honor. And my students who now teach it also discovered how tough it is. It's tough to pass those tools on. Is it perhaps related to the fact that you do not possess those tools? No. I don't think so, Your Honor. I mean, I know what you mean, I know what you mean, but I don't think so. I mean, if I had the tools in the way that you're trying to imply tools, I'd be on stage, Your Honor, but I'm not on stage, they are. What do I need what they need? But would you like to say something, anything about improvisation for those who don't know? Two things, Your Honor, it's improvisation and not the opposite, that's the second thing. But what would you say to those who do equate a comedian with jazz? I feel sorry for them, Your Honor. I've got a stack of jazz albums, vinyl. It's apparently supposed to enhance the theatrical experience while remaining connected and, theme, you know, thematically to the character in play. I don't buy it, you know? We didn't find that. You know, we found the opposite. And we're looking into changing that, Your Honor. Well, how are you going to change it? By changing it. A any examples of what constitutes a comedian improv? Who's on first, Your Honor? Who's on? Oh, I, mean, I see, yeah. Do you know why? No idea, Your Honor. You know, we've been dealing with that one for a long time at the university. You know, we've screened the footage over and over again. You know, it's like there's a Pruder film. Some things just don't make sense, but they do. And that's where we're at. You know, we're actually going to have a cross scan of the conference on that. On what? On all those things we can't figure out. See how many of us are in the dark about those things, Your Honor? What's your feeling? Oh, there are a lot more of us in the dark than we think there are, Your Honor. And what do you plan to do with the results, your findings? Well, perhaps introduce pilot and undergraduate course titled In the Dark, looking at the numbers, you know, at the stats, you know, playing with them, that kind of thing, you know? Any idea what you will be doing when you retire? When I what? After, oh, I got you. Yeah, I heard, Your Honor. After what I heard about what happens to teachers who retire, I don't think I even want to go there, Your Honor. Apparently, 18 months after they retire, most of them kick the bucket. I'm going to stay busy and become a critic. What kind of a critic? Well, you know, theater, of course, Your Honor, but comedia specifically. I find there's a vacuum there and it needs to be filled. Will you be doing anything differently? You know, not really, Your Honor. I mean, I think consistently is everything. You know, consistency, consistency. I've built a reputation on what I know and how I know it and how I do it. I don't think I'm willing to give that up just now and go into something I know nothing about. How lucky are we? This defense obviously came after the plaintiff had a chance to state his case, and you are, sir, um, Arlecchino. No, I mean, I mean, well, I mean, I'm the actor, but I play Arlecchino. In the Amherst, I play Arlecchino, sir. Can you state your name, please? No, your name. No, the one I was given at birth, Your Honor. I don't want to all of a sudden, you know, mention who I am, and then it's bad enough that I'm in court, you know. I don't want to have to advertise my name, because that's how I make, you know, that's my name, you know, that's how I make a living, and you know. Well, keep it quiet, please. It's in there, what you got in your files. Thank you, Your Honor. Is there a reason why you uh, decided to come to court in costume? Well, you know, no, 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 well, no, 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 for now, but maybe yes, you know. But I want to say this, Your Honor, method actors are not the only ones, you know, who live their character, okay? That's wrong. That's maybe why I did this, Your Honor. The notion or suggestion that there is a, a, a person in the world qualified to define, identify, and prove the existence of inside out versus outside in acting as if such a thing really existed and able to recognize and separate actors practicing one from actors practicing the other is as idiotic and preposterous and dangerous as a Hitler's definition of and search for a pure race. And Your Honor, you look me in the face when you're listening to me talking to you. Sorry, I get carried away, Your Honor. It's easy to costume, like a mask. I put it on, like, you know. Any actor, Your Honor, theater artist, director, playwright, or critic who looks for what is different in all the acting methods instead of recognizing their similarity is an idiot on the cusp of becoming a lunatic in search of his or Waco, Texas, or Jonestown, Guyana, or worse still, hoping to lead his or her temple of followers to build the next generation gas chambers and ovens. Because to categorize actors, Your Honor, methods, and to categorize people, that is exactly what it is. Categorizing, to categorize people is to sort them by color, food, culture, religion, art, height, smell, gender, age, intelligence, education. Your phone, Your Honor, answer your phone. Oh, shit, it's mine, sorry. Sorry, Your Honor, my little Arlecchino changed the tune from Hello Moto to William Tell, not used to it. I gotta answer it, you know, with me, you know, in court and being in court and all that. I need all the work I can get. Excuse me, Your Honor. Hello, yeah, I'm in court. I can't talk, I'm on the stand. I didn't do anything. Just because I'm taking the stand doesn't mean I'm guilty. I gotta go, bye. Sorry, Your Honor, theater beams, beams, no, Brock, I mean Belleville. I told them, no horses, they're not funny. Forget it, 50 ducks pulling a comedian wagon, that's funny, you know, no ducks. Get swans, I said. Lots of them napping there in that lake in Stratford. I know, it's not a lake. Tom Patterson won't mind. It's not like the theater needs them, you know, they're getting their last. Life. 
like you every day in Stratford, Your Honor. We need them. I'll lick you. Yes, sir. I'm listening, Your Honor. You go by several names. You, you refer to yourself as the double horn. Oh, yeah, 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 because, you know, those things that we have, you know, the, the horns, you're, I mean, on the mask. And I think, you know, I thought the devil's horn. I'm thinking about the saxophone was the devil's horn. I was working on that theme, you mean, during the production. That's right, Your Honor. That's right. Uh, you studied comedian. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh-huh. Where? Oh, everywhere. But, well, actually, I had taken classes with a director. He used to, you know, be a teacher of mine. And, you know, it was like, hey, you know, great to reconnect. You know what I mean? You know, I heard a lot of stuff about him. You know, not of it, you know, bad and not good. Very, you know, but I mean, what are you going to do? You, you got to work, right? I mean, this is kind of, it's all bad, you know? So we, anyway, that's it, Your Honor. I see. And what, you, what was your experience with it? Well, I heard what he said. I mean, I, I know what he's going to say. And he's going to get a chance to say what he's got to say. And I kind of know where it's going to go. You know, you know, it's kind of hard, Your Honor. You know, standing up here, I mean, it takes, you know, I, I don't want to toot my own horn, Your Honor. But, you know, it takes guts standing up here. You know, I mean, I, it's, I, I, we could have gone, you know, further. Maybe we, you know, we, what would you have done? I would have improvised, Your Honor. I would have thought that was a way to go. You know, we had a couple of, uh, we had a couple of good things going our way, Your Honor. You know, like what? Well, like life. Uh, I mean, there was this guy sleeping in the audience, you know, the, the, you know, and the critics there. I mean, it would have been great. We could have explored that. And, and how, you know, I had this idea, you know, the guy comes in, Brigella, you know, and I'm just going to say, hey, look at the guy. The guy goes, what guy? The guy over there, you know, the sleeping guy, the critic, whatever. But no, you know, we had to announce the arrival time of the improvisation in case you missed it. <laughs> improvisation, gate five arriving in five minutes, you know. I mean, Your Honor, how long have you played this character? How many times? Oh, Your Honor, I played him with a mask. Without a mask, I played him with, you know, without shoes, barefoot, and all that. You know, he's, I, I, I played him so many ways. The thing about the guy, Your Honor, is food. He's hungry, and you know, he's like a slave. You know, the immigrant, the wop, the nigger, the kike, the pack, the chink, the chap, the Muslim, you name it. He's the eternal puppet of the underclass and the underprivileged with a strong desire to survive, live, love, and enjoy a decent meal, hoping one day to gain respect and equal power, the eternal outsider trying to find a way in, Your Honor. And I think that that, you know, just mm, mm, getting in, that that needed to come out, Your Honor. You know, that mm, needed to, mm, mm. I'm anxious to hear what he's got to say to the director because I think sometimes we're being, you know, we're unfair to these directors. And, you know, maybe we're too in the show, you know what I mean? You know, we don't get a chance to see what they're, you know, you know, they got ideas, you know, these fucking things coming out of their fucking brains, you know, you're, uh, sorry, pardon the language, Your Honor. I mean, you know, we don't want to undermine their ideas because, you know, but we just want to act, act, me, me, look at me, ooh, act, act, that. And, you you know, they got these fucking things growing. They gotta admit, you know. I mean, anyway, I mean, this is not Italy. I know, you know, but uh, so, you gotta respect their ideas, Your Honor. You know, your specific grievances. Let's, oh, thank you, Your Honor. I guess part of the reason why I came to court is to, to get a hearing, but to get a meeting with the guy, you know, to listen. To listen. It was the only way to get him into this, you know, to say, what the fuck were you doing with that show? It's so fucking bad. What are you doing with the show? But I'm keen, Your Honor. You know, I'm keen. I'm keen. I think personally, we could have used trains. Trains are running our theater here. They're everywhere, you know? Might as well use them. You know, the, I mean, the background. I mean, you could hear them all the way from the Tarragon Theater. I mean, apparently, you know, in the old days, no kidding, Your Honor, at the factory, when the trains went by, you know, they'd freeze. Actors would freeze. Excuse me, Your Honor. When you're making love, Your Honor, when you're having, you know, with your wife, your girlfriend, I don't know, maybe you got both, you know? I don't know, maybe you're like that CBC funny guy, you know, you know, both. <laughs> but do you stop? No, you don't stop making love because there's a strain. You just kind of keep going, right? You're you like the train. You're going, you're going, you're going, you go. We could have used that. There are so many things we could have done, Your Honor. Lots of things we could learn. And the fourth, sorry, Your Honor, the fourth wall busts my, burns my ass. The fourth, well, the fourth wall, it burns my ass. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I mean, you ever see a stand-up comic pretending to break in the fourth wall? They'd be dead! Like most of our theater, it doesn't exist in Committee of the Larte, Your Honor. The audience is a character, but a real character. But in Canada, we're not happy with one fourth wall. No, we've decided to put up two. The one the actors pretend to break and the one they erect just beyond that between them and the actual audience. Is that a stage manager, Your Honor? Oh, a stenographer, thank you. In fact, Your Honor, actors invent a fake audience, okay, between the two fourth walls and ignore the one that is actually there. And they walk, look, I'm breaking the fucking fourth wall. Shut the fuck up, break the fucking wall here. Do this, Jesus Christ, Your Honor. I would have broken that first wall, improvised, and then blamed the other actor for not sticking to the script. You see that? You get that, Your Honor? Huh? That's my function as Arlecchino. And then I would have targeted the two guys, you know, the sleeping actor and the critic. You know, see, Brigrella comes in, you know, and he says, who? I say, him, him, the one sleeping in the seat by the eye. You know, the one who hasn't seen or acknowledged one goddamn bit of artistry since the first scene of the first act. You could have taken him away with you on that train that just went by, or were you freezing? You know, as far away from the theater as possible. That's what happens when you give complimentary tickets. We die. 
We die. We all die in the theater. I'm talking to Brigella now, Your Honor. And then Brigella says, I'll be dead and then fired if I don't take this letter to my master. Let me see that letter. And, you know, I, 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 I can't read it. And Brigella says, you know, well, you can't write. Yeah, can you write? He goes, no, I don't need to. I'm just delivering. Well, shouldn't you read it before you deliver it? It didn't say that. Which it didn't say that. Well, the, it, the, the one, the, what do you mean? The instructions, the one who gave it to me. Well, who gave it to you? The one who didn't give it to you. It's confidential. How do you know it's confidential if you can't read it? Now, Brigella's stuck with the improv. Oh, because uh, 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 I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. You tell me. Don't tell me what to tell you. I'm asking you. Now, tell me. No, don't. Just a second. Get him to read it for you. Him over there. Now, Brigella, back to the improv. He looks at the sleeping audience member, whispering, sleeping. I go, no, what, you're worried about waking him up? What is this, a sleep clinic? Anyway, not that him. The other him over there, the guy next to him across the aisle. Now, Brigella, shocked, realizing it's a theater critic. Oh, my God. What? It's, you know, who? Arlequino. I see the theater critic. Oh, my God. So, can't he read? No, 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 no. <laughs> He's writing that he can read. No, 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 no. You're, a lot of writing. He's not. Oh my God, he's writing. Now he's. Uh, and now the actor speaks. Oh my God, he's now he's writing faster and faster, and faster. Page after page after page. But he's now slowing down the way I'm slowing down. Maybe he's writing about you and me. What? We're oh, oh, that's it. We're dead. We are gone. We are dead. Check it. Is he writing now? Is he? Don't 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 talk. Don't move your lips. Is he writing now? No, I can't see. You look. No, I'm busy. I'm asking you. Is he writing down? Take a peek. Look at the audience. Yes, he is. No. Don't worry, he was writing about me. I mean, I mean, how well I pronounce those Italian phrases. Dev Shab, point of echo, boy. Dev Shab. No, Dev Shab. Dev Shab, Dev Shab. The point of, you know, I mean, he was writing about me, then you walked in, you talked, and he stopped. Normal. Speak up, Mr. Brigella. A little clarity, please. Diction if you want to be mentioned by him. Careful, he knows his stuff. He's half Italian, and the other half knows how to play an oud. A what? An oud. Oud, oud, oud. Yeah, oud, good. Good, an oud, good. What is an oud? You see that? You don't even know what an oud is. Yeah. An oud is a lovely loot, mandolin thing. I'll have to buy him a new one as a gift for everything he's saying about me and writing. Well, he was writing also while I was talking, Arlequino. In fact, I think we were in sync. You know, he was going faster and slower depending on how I was. Well, no, he hadn't finished writing about me. That's why he had to wrap on everything I did before you came in. Leave him alone! Leave him alone! He's mine! Get your own critic! No, he's gonna roast you. I just know it, Arlecchino. Me? Me? I've been here busting my ass trying to keep him awake. That guy's sleeping, the other guy's writing. All you have to do is deliver one lousy letter and look at you, look at you, you're still here. Now, Your Honor, back to the actual text, you know what I mean? Are you not ashamed? Have you no dignity? Now, back to the improv, no, to the sleeping audience member, Your Honor. Wake up, sir, you, yeah, yeah, you, wake up. A little respect for Goldoni, please. Everyone else is pretending to like it. Why can't you be a little bit more like them? Hey, Arlecchino, what do you want? He's, he's an actor, who? He, him, Sleeping Beauty. Yeah, he's awake now, and he's ugly. Yeah, he's, hey, he's, what's his name? You know, the guy, the guy. Oh, yeah, 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 I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, I know who you mean. Yeah, 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 what's his name? He's a friend, a good friend, a famous guy. What's his name? Uh, yeah, yeah, him, yeah. yeah. No, it's not him. No, no, it looks like him. I know the him you mean. No, no, it's not that him. He never would have done that, not the type. He would have done what we all do. Even if you don't like it, you go backstage after the show and you tell the actors how much you loved it, how much you wish you could have been up there with them, and that we must work together on some project somewhere sometime soon, and that the production was so interesting and the way the word interesting was never used before. And the other actor, me, says, well, actually, that's how I took it. Thank you. And the guy goes, goodbye, kiss, 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 kiss. Can't go for a drink, he says. But great show, call me. Really like to see you soon. Are you in town? He asked, of course I'm in town. You just saw my show. I was on stage. I'm always in town. What are you talking about? I did. Okay, good, 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 good. Of course. I'm mean, anyway. Good to see you. He says, I say, good to see you too. Okay, bye. Thanks for coming. Are you kidding me? He says, thanks for the show. That's what the other him would have done. This him is a cheap facsimile to the you go back to sleep, sir. We don't need you. We thought you were another him, a better him, one who cares, who shares our concerns, our fears, and knows what it means to be up here. But you don't know anything, sir. And unless you go back to sleep, we won't continue with the show, and you'll have to deal with them. <laughs> Arlecchino, Arlecchino, what if they just feel like him, but they don't have the guts to fall asleep? Nobody paid, they're all comes. You know what? Do, do you have to hate everything I do? Do you have everything, everything about me? Guts. Don't you have a letter to deliver? Do you have to resent everything I do? Guts. You, sir, whatever your name is, yeah, stop laughing. The complimentary ticket wasn't even meant for you, okay? It was a last minute thought. We had a meeting, we took pity on you because you apparently don't have a home or bed to sleep and writing your two fucking letters. You know how many fucking times I've slept through your lousy, cheap, predictable, phony, contrived, unnatural method up your yin-yang performances. Now leave the theater, sir, and go run Actra. They need you. The theater certainly doesn't. And Your Honor, now I go to back to the actual tax in the scene, you fucking idiot. Are you talking to me? No, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the fucking idiot who just left him. No, Your Honor, I'm talking to him, but I'm looking at you. It's a Madam Speaker thing. I don't want to provoke him too much. You know what I mean? Well, I thought the scene was finished. Well, it is, Your Honor, but it's still in here. You know, I didn't get it all out. You know, I don't have to get a chance to state my case in court, Your Honor. But I, but I want to be careful, idiot. Okay? Who me? No, no, not you. I'm talking still to him. He's the idiot. You know? Well, why are you looking at me? No, I'm not looking. I told you, Your Honor, it's a comedy thing. You talk to the actor through the audience. Okay? He's not even. Well, he's not there. Well, of course he's there. I was just talking to him. You heard me talk. 
them. The sleeping actor is the audience, but when I'm talking to him, you become the audience because I'm doing it for you. But I talk to him by looking at you, and I talk to you by looking at him. You see, you're under this fourth wall thing is really complicated. I got myself into a fucking chat. Sorry, part of the language. I got a fourth wall here with them. I got another here with a sleeping actor, and then I got out here with, with you. I'm trying to break them all at the same time. Oh, I you know, I need Tai Chi. I don't know what I need, Your Honor. And then I had to bring the sleeping actor and the critic, and it got all complicated. That's why you fucking idiot. Who me? No, him. I'm talking to him. But you're looking at him, so you meant it for me. Who was I looking at, Your Honor? Him. Then he's the idiot. But you said no. But then you said for me to change what I was doing, Your Honor. You see, that's the problem. You do your thing, the director doesn't get it. Then he tells you to change it. Then you change it. He blames you for changing it, Your Honor. You make me go crazy. I don't know what to say to you, Your Honor. You know, I'm just gonna go look here, Your Honor, right here, Your Honor, okay? Not at you, not at him, not at you. Just here, these four walls. And there's that smell, Your Honor. There's that fetid, acrid smell. Open the pit and let me drop to the hell that Dante wrote for me. And I'll try to cross that fixed fucking arc. And the walls were closing in on me. Friday, October the 13th, had a pre-reading of letter two. Another glorious day in hell. Two devils came to dance, disguised as angels to trample on my soul and taste its breaking point, the night of the long knives. The PR ghost and the PhD ghost, self-preservation was their truth. Helping me was how they put it. The PR ghost believed the Arlecchino was a cheap shot of the critics, a contrivance, self-indulgence, a cop-out, that had dishonored letter two like letter two had been written with her. Courage, as she would call it. When I told her Arlecchino was letter two from day one, she said it was simply a misunderstanding. I said, not to worry. Misunderstandings outnumber understandings, a thousand to one in the theater. The PhD ghost wondered if the problem with the letter two was in the writing or in the acting, heavily leading towards both. The tone wrong in both, the anger too much in both. And now this was a rant, Tony, and nothing else, or so it appeared, she said. Confirmed by the godmother of acting coach's ghost, no less, present at the pre-reading. And then the PhD ghost took a dagger to finish a job she was destined to perfect since the day one of the letter. And she said, you should have stuck to the 70-page letter to the critics, Tony, and left it at that. We're behind you 100%, Tony. I hope you see that, said both ghosts in harmony. I understand I misunderstood, but I'm speaking for the layperson, said the PR ghost. And though I know nothing about comedia, I know there will be people like me, Tony, who will feel what I feel. And I want to protect you from that. You know, when I thought about Mauro in Rome, how easy it is to forget and become the enemy of the actor. Revenge crossed my mind, but there was more human flesh to be privately devoured. Mine? And I was curious to see who was that hungry. And so I followed the PhD ghost to a beach. She was all cloak and daggers, so it seemed. And there we met the godmother of acting coach's ghost. She weighed in on letter two with a lifetime of knowledge as teacher, as actress, as writer, godmother of all the fucking devils, finding nothing worth nothing in letter two or in me, resented those who laughed at the trial scene for doing me a disservice. Shut up, she said. And I told her to go fuck herself, that my tongue could rip her heart out if I were as hungry as she. Ask my blood, I said, and I'm not proud of it. As a conciliatory move, she shared her most human explanation for letter two's failure. The power of my presence, Tony, at the pre-reading should not be underestimated. I made all the difference. Everyone in the room knew who I was. There's a lot of power in that, Tony. I considered dropping a fucking match, frying her fucking soul there and then. And then she threw me a life jacket. Why don't you mention the actor's name, Tony? She's your heroine. She's your point. Isn't this about her? About you? I'm protecting her, I said. She never asked to go public. And I stopped in mid-sentence, realizing the lie I had embraced as a principle, as a truth. No, you're right, I said. That's why I came here tonight, to see you. I was looking for the enemy in me all day long, and I knew that I would find it here. If a critic can kill the art and the actress, should I not resurrect it? Is it right to collude with her silence? Isn't that hell? Should I not name the name of her art? I mean, if I love her and trust her, why not call her by name? Why am I protecting myself? Have the courage to say her name. Tony! Does it take the same courage to reveal yours? I thanked the godmother ghost and left, embracing the authority of her wisdom, but still hating the authority of her manner, wherein lies her hell. And then spoke with some ghosts of the pre-reading nightmare. Hey, did you know who she was, overwhelmed by her power? The cleaver stuck in the neck ghost said, no, I just saw a woman in the corner so tight in herself. I thought, hey, who's the corpse with the lip job? No, I said, don't, no, no, I said, don't laugh. My father had the same expression, lying in his coffin, lips tight by their own silence, lips, Good and evil, in equal measure, a mouth that encourages creativity and destroys it to recreate it in her own image. The benevolent tyrant, a terrorist. I don't hate her. 
I hate the her in everyone and in me. Well, you know, kid, said the cleaver ghost, you asked for it, you know, you use Dante, he's gonna make you pay the price of admission, you know? There's more hell to come, Tony, beware. <sighs> the name of the art, the name of the actress. Why say her name, Tony? The philosopher ghost. Well, because she's a whistling kettle, like Arlecchino, and nobody listens. It's easy not to listen to comedy. That's why Arlecchino says what he needs to say, gets his laughs, collects his money, and goes to another town before they lynch him. But you listened. No, I'm just one. Like Mrs. Schachter was one in Ellie Wiesel's night. You know, another fucking whistling kettle, you know, stuffed in a cattle car out of her fucking mind when she yelled, fire, I see fucking fire. I see flames. I see huge flames. But there was nothing but night. And so they silenced her with kicks and blows that could have killed. Only when the fucking train arrived in hell, Auschwitz, did the others see the flames from the chimneys and the stench of death floating in the night air. And the little 14-year-old girl in a small Amsterdam apartment who could see what the world outside of it could not. Hard to believe, but not hard to fucking believe, eh? Another whistling kettle, that little girl. I mean, do you fucking think? Do you actually think, Kamal, that Goldoni's plays will no longer be around 200 years from now and that Mambo Italiano corner gas type plays will? I mean, maybe you should visit Striller's grave and ask him that. Dig up his fucking grave, exhume his body, and talk to his bones. You've already woken them up, and you will find that there's more eloquence and humanity in those fucking bones than your ideas about commedia or theater. And ask him why a Goldoni play was the beginning and defining moment of Italy's post-war theater revolution, and he'll fucking tell you, I'm dead! But the production I first directed in 1947 is still touring 50 years after it opened to become the longest-running play in Italian theater. What more do you want from me, Camille? Now put me back where you found me and let me fucking sleep. I've earned it or I'll bury you in this fucking grave. That's what he'd tell you, Kamal. And he'd make room for you too, Richard. I mean, too much is going on in our world to waste words in print or on the stage. Make it difficult for people to hate you for the wrong reasons. Let it be for the integrity and the DNA of your pieces and not for your ignorance of any theater craft. I don't read everything you write, but when I read it, I care. And you should care that I care, that anyone cares. But if this is what you do while you're busy making other plans, I suggest you collect your Lifetime Achievement Award now. Get out of the way and get out of the theater. And give the gig to Christy Blatchford, a woman with ovaries, as they say in Italy, who writes about death and destruction, perfect for our theater. You know, Tyrone Guthrie spoke the truth when he argued that Canadian artists, if they are to thrive, must express what the Canadian climate, the Canadian soil, and their fellow Canadians have made of them. Perhaps Nathan Cohen's was right in stating the theater never counted in the life of English language Canada, or is it likely to in any reasonable, foreseeable future? Yet there are actors and playwrights who are taking initiative, attempting to do stuff that connects, that touches, notwithstanding the climate they have to work in. My limitations, like yours, shine every time I come across a person whose level of craft inspires awe, whose understanding of humanity, especially their own, instills compassion and critical thinking in the bowels of my being and guides my journey out of hell. That rare someone also reminds me why we don't make pit stops at fire hydrants to relieve our bladders or unload our number two on neighbors' front lawns, but dogs do. Unfortunately, people who inspire such awe are rarely found in the ranks of Canadian theater directors. I did not say never, rarely. Actors know it, the young and the old, the great and not so great, the living and the dead. Our legacy as Canadian actors might be that we dared more often and often more truth was said in bars than on the stage. We museumize our theater and craft and yet make fun of poor ignorant bastards with dead living room homes and plastic covered sofas. We have the audacity to perform Ibsen's An Enemy of the People while dismissing his warning to remain faithful to your principles and have the courage to stand alone even in the face of a disagreeing and hostile majority. Worse still, we expect praise for our efforts and courage, give me a fucking bucket. We forget the challenging our theater status quo with any play would vindicate Ibsen's play and show us the great value of his message. We forget that Bernard Shaw's plays were not ornamental gifts, silver plattered to the establishment that initially elected to ban them, but purgatives to shake the society out of its coma. We have the plays, old and new from all cultures, as constant reminders and the ones yet to be written by all the different cultures in our culture. It's what we do with them once they're written. Otherwise, what are plays for? What is memory? I mean, what is history? What is culture? What is the future? We don't need cathedrals of consumption. We need devils wherever they build one. Should everything come down? Should theater schools come down? Should theater funding stop? 
Well, while you think on that, find your madman or woman of choice, your whistling kettle, the one pointing to a fire or a flame you have yet to see or fail to see, and then kill them. And if the mad one is you, jump out of a fucking window or hang from a ceiling. So before you kill me, for having said what I said, for having said too much, not enough, for not having said it well enough, before you kill me, kill me for having said what you wanted to say but didn't. Before you kill me for what you could have said, much better. Before you kill me because you can't kill yourself and find it easier to kill me. Before you kill me for not having workshopped this letter to death. Before you kill me for not having written two letters instead of one play. Before you kill me for saying the theater is the whorehouse of deceivers, flatterers, murderers, and cowards. Before you kill me for having made my micro your macro. Look at your hands as I look at mine. And now you know what Lady M was feeling. And watch your back, always. And especially in the theater. How are you going to end this? How are you going to get out of this? Oh, great. Even in hell, a dramaturg in residence, the philosopher ghost. Well, Tony, I mean, you won't make any money, you won't make any friends, you probably won't make a difference. Are you willing to go down that path? Well, I think I'm in that path. I mean, I can't write an ending because there is no end in sight. No ending, no contrivance, no coup de théâtre. Can never change the fact that the only way out of this hell is if you write the ending with me. Till then, we remain here, at least I remain here. And if you haven't left and are still here listening to this, chances are you're in the same hell. What better or worse ending than that? I mean, hell is having to write these letters instead of the many letters I used to write to my three and a half year old prophet. It's a choice, I know. In hell, you have choices as well. You can do all the bad things you want. There's no longer, you're gonna go to hell to deter you. Since we've invented that lame deterrent, we've only proven that hell is on earth and that we only managed to increase its temperature while pretending to fear the hell of novels and Bibles. So before you kill me, know that the best way to do that is do nothing. Let this hell thrive. It's great, you know, you can commit a crime without being found guilty, without being arrested, tried or convicted. You can kill me and you by just doing nothing. Isn't that wonderful, you know? You don't have to confess, no fingerprints. You don't have to spend time in prison. You don't have to be absolved. You can murder and commit self-murder by doing nothing. Two crimes, Boxing Day special. Nobody will find you guilty. How can they? They're guilty of the same crimes, undetectable by any law. Just do nothing. So you know that when you see or meet someone who says there is no such thing as a perfect crime, they're lying. They're lying. They're deceiving you. They know that you're in the act of committing the perfect crime. They just don't want to let you know they know in case you wake up and decide to leave hell for good. Thank you. <laughs>